This is going to be a long haul story, people. I've been working on this video on and off for about the past five months, and at the end of it all, here we are. I know that the duration of this video is a little daunting. Believe me, the video had a lot more potential to be so much longer than it is. To make it a little easier for everyone, I'm including timestamps of every section in this video listed on screen as well as in the description below. As many friends can attest, this video has been by far one of the most challenging things I've done so far. It has tested my abilities as a writer, a storyteller, cartoonist, as well as an editor. There are many who called me bonkers for attempting to tackle this game. Others saying that it wasn't worth talking about and I should just work on something else. But like I said in that teaser all those months ago, everyone else might be saying that it's no use. But I say to them, not to me it isn't. Wanting to shake up a story for an already established franchise is something that a lot of people consider doing, especially when you take into account that this series may be very simplistic in its formula when it comes to writing a story. Sonic the Hedgehog as a series is very basic. Now this necessarily isn't a bad thing, it just means that most people can get into this series both as a longtime fan or even as a potential newcomer. It's easy to understand narratively as well as a game mechanic. A cool blue dude trying to save the innocent by stopping an evil genius. It's simple. It's honest. It's a formula that is timeless at this point. However, the phrase, don't fix what isn't broken, would be commonplace in reference to when Sonic the Hedgehog was, essentially, going to get the reboot treatment. In mid-2005, advertisements start showing up at the Electronic Entertainment Expo, also known as E3, as well as the Tokyo Game Show Convention, promoting that a new Sonic the Hedgehog game was on the horizon. In September of 2005, the president of the Sonic team at the time, Yuji Naka, shared details that the development team were working on a new game and were going to treat it like it was the first in the series, committing themselves to the idea that this would be rebooting the Sonic universe. This time, however, they were given a new specific goal when forwarding the momentum of this production. What if Sonic the Hedgehog existed in the real world, and the game was intended to take players back to the roots of the series, a time before the likes of both Sonic Adventure games? However, this game became a conversational piece wrought with negativity. The problems were all over the place, rushed development cycles, Yuji Naka resigning from Sonic Team, the Sonic Team itself being split to finish developing this game while the other half worked on a completely different game. And the most critical error of all, the team had completely ignored quality assurance reports from game testers so that this game could ship for holiday 2006. To this day, this game is still regarded by fans as one of the worst games in the series. Even though the name of the game was Sonic the Hedgehog, the gaming community would go on to give it another name a label that sticks to it even 13 years plus after it was released. The game was Sonic 06. Most people criticize this game for being very buggy, the mechanics being weirdly stilted, the visuals not feeling nearly as next generation as they could have been. For me, as the story freak that I am, there was one thing about Sonic 06 that always sat wrong with me. The story in this game is just boring. The plot is weirdly uninteresting. Sure, it had a lot of unique and different ideas in terms of how things were done compared to previous entries, but somehow Sonic 06 managed to do way too many things while doing barely anything at all. The plot of Sonic 06 is a tad weird, as it's a game with multiple main protagonists, being Sonic, Shadow, and the new character introduced in this game, Silver. Sonic's story goes a little bit like this. Sonic the Hedgehog always knows when Eggman is up to something. When Eggman travels to the kingdom of Soliana, Sonic knows it's for some nefarious reason. Sonic shows up and saves the current monarch of Soliana. Just when they think they're safe, Elise is captured by Eggman. Now Sonic, along with his friends, must try to save Elise and stop Eggman from carrying out his plan. Shadow's story goes like this. Shadow the Hedgehog, an operative of the military organization GUN, has received a mission to save a fellow agent, Rouge the Bat, from one of Eggman's secret compounds. While there, they recover an artifact from Soliana that Eggman had stole for his plan. When the artifact is broken, an ancient evil calling itself Mephilus is released. After copying Shadow's appearance, Mephilus plans to capture Princess Elise to awaken a power that slumbers within her so that he can become whole again. Shadow, Rouge, 
Rouge are then cast far into the future by Mephiles and to see what happened if his plans succeed. Now they must find a way to stop Mephiles and get back in time by any means necessary. Then we have Silver the Hedgehog, a newcomer to this series that has been given the powers of psychokinesis, the ability to move things and manipulate things purely with the power of the mind. Silver's story is the following. In the far future is a world covered by unstoppable flames. Two of the only survivors are Silver the Hedgehog and his friend Blaze the Cat, both of whom do their best to try to stop a creature of incredible power, a creature known as Iblis. While looking for some kind of solution, they're approached by a mysterious figure calling themselves Mephilus, who gives them a vision of the past and shows them who or what caused the world to be engulfed in these flames and given the chance to go back and stop them from causing the world to be engulfed in flames. When Silver goes into the past, he finds that not everything was the way he was told it was, leading him down a path of justice that is swarmed with questions about what really happened and what he can do to save the future from an eternity of flames. To be frank, the reason why this could read like an interesting setup for a story is because there's a lot of unique potential for doing a multi-perspective story, where characters witness the same event but how they arrive, as well as their own perspective, change how these actual interactions will differ depending on who you're playing as. The problem that Sonic 06 faces is that none of the stories on their own are that outstanding, which means that on their own you're not going to get a lot of satisfaction out of any one of these stories. It's only when you take the time to actually play all three parts of the story do you actually get a full narrative going on. To be fair, that is one of the biggest challenges when creating a multi-perspective story. Now, that doesn't mean that the elements that we are given in this game are inherently bad. Realistically, the base of the narrative is one that had huge potential for this story to be something solid. The problem is, at its core, it comes down to this realization that this game didn't know what it wanted to do with itself on a bunch of different fronts. There are five main issues with the narrative of Sonic 06 as a whole. Firstly, the game limits itself by using the real-world idea to guide its narrative. Second, Solaris, Mephilus, and Iblis are supremely uninteresting antagonists. Third, time travel is greatly misused and is super unfocused in terms of its uses and its rules. Fourth, certain characters have no reason to be in this story, when they really should. Finally, all of the other side characters just sort of meander and don't really do anything for the story when they realistically should. Each one of these elements plays against what Sonic 06 could have been and how we understand these elements. So, without further ado, let's run our examination on each one of these ideas. First and foremost, the moment you make the goal of this game to be, what if Sonic took place in the real world? You immediately put an enormous restriction against the story. Sonic Adventures 1 and 2, and to some extent Sonic Unleashed, got away with this idea because it wasn't the goal of the game or their narratives. These were games that took place in a Sonic world that happened to have humans in them, not a human world with Sonic characters. The term real world concept is said to make the audience understand that certain rules apply, and unfortunately within the first minute of the story, Sonic 06 breaks this rule, completely negating the whole goal of this game, making it pointless. This is not the real world, it is a work of fiction. They invented a new location that immediately establishes a level of fantasy. Some people would probably label this as nitpicky as it comes off as me focusing on one really small detail, but I have to bring it up because it allows us to understand the key thing when it comes to reimagining this idea. We're going to ditch the idea of it taking place in the real world, and there's one really simple way that you can do that. Removing the human character characters and replacing them with birds. Allow me to explain. The problem with humans in Sonic games is that they just don't work as well as some people might think that they do. Ask yourself this, besides Dr. Eggman, how many mainline games in the Sonic series openly include humans in the narrative? Not background NPCs, actual contributors to the plot that are human beings. There have been a total of 32 Sonic games, both in 2D and 3D formats, not including racing, games, arcade variants, educational games, spin-offs, and compilations. After looking through all of them, there's really only been four games that use human characters in the narrative, being Sonic Adventure 2 with Gerald and Maria Robotnik, the President and Commander from Shadow the Hedgehog, Sonic 06 had Princess Elise, and Sonic Unleashed had Professor Pickle. As a large collection of fans could potentially confirm, that's not really the best track record for human-based plot characters. Simply put, humans in Sonic games are incredibly difficult to include because they tend to be very one-note characters. I'm sorry, Elise is not a 
captivating character. I know some people like her, but I'm talking about as a narratively included character, she's just a textbook example of a damsel in distress. While some of the ideas in Sonic 06 had interesting potential, they either don't go anywhere or aren't given enough time to develop into a unique idea. This begs the question, why would I want to replace the humans of Soleana in Sonic 06 with something like bird characters? Well, by doing this, you're no longer grounding yourself with the limitations of what kind of world you want to create. It means a version of the story that we're going to be getting feels a lot more in line with the series that we've grown with, a continuation of a series that we've been playing for for so long, except it's now just for a new age of video game consoles. Do you need to remove the humans? No. I'm choosing to because it takes on a different identity. So why bird characters? I mean, come on, look at Princess Elise. She's dressed like a bird. Why dress with feathers, neon, orange leggings, right? Wait, please don't tell me I'm the only one who sees her looking like a duck or a chicken or some kind of I gotta find out. Okay, come on, come on, come on. I gotta find something. There's gotta be something. Ha! Okay, user by the name of Spinballing on Tumblr has got my back on this one. Look, they doodled it. Oh, and it's adorable. They've depicted Elise as a dove. Please go show them some love. I'll have their account listed in the description below. I don't know them personally, but they got an art style I'm a fan of. Tell me, PZ sent ya. Making the citizens of Soliana into birds actually does two things that play hand in hand with each other. Firstly, yes, it's clear that Elise's design was supposed to be based off of some kind of bird that can easily be put together. But it actually allows us to shift the identity and characterization of the deity known as Solaris. Up until this point in the mainline series, we really haven't had any bird-based civilizations in the Sonic games, so it's nice to see a change in landscape. And before anybody gets ready to type this out, yes, I know, Sonic writers had bird characters. I don't really consider that as counting towards this mark, because that wasn't a civilization anymore, and we never really see it. There's only three Babylonians, Jet, Wave, and Storm, in the actual game and even then they're descendants of what that civilization was. I'm sorry, they don't count. Moving on, let's talk about Solaris. Solaris is a deity of unknowable power, indescribable by those who worship them as a god. Solaris is almost a Lovecraftian kind of element behind them. Being unimaginable in their power and their true nature and form is up to the imagination of the individual. What's the problem with having that as an antagonistic force in a story? Well, it's because they're indescribable, in some case literally faceless. While Iblis and Mephilus are at least characters, uh, more the latter than the former, Solaris is more of a construct than a character that lacks any real direction or purpose. Ask yourself this question. Is Solaris actually evil in the original story? It's a really muddled element that never really gets established in any way. I'm sure some would liken it to the idea that Solaris used to be either benevolent or at least indifferent until the Duke of Soliana enacted the Solaris Project, which caused Solaris to be split into two pieces, Mephilus, the mind of Solaris, and Iblis, the raw power of Solaris. It should be made clear that Mephilus being evil is never actually elaborated upon in the game. We, the players, just assume that it was by the Duke's actions that caused Mephilus to don this distaste or hatred for the creatures that ripped them into this state of imbalance. But because it's never mentioned in the story, we never truly find out or know this. Perhaps Solaris was always a hostile creature, a deity that coasted through time, waiting for the moment to enact their plans to destroy the world. Was Solaris being worshipped by Soliana just a fluke? A misinterpretation of who or what Solaris was to the world? Again, we never know or find this out within the game, and can only speculate the motives of this faceless entity. This is our chance to develop this in a more roundabout way. I suggest we make three distinct changes to Solaris. Their design, their goal, and something I'm calling the three-way split. First, the design. When it comes to both forms of Solaris, the design we got in the game ranges from muddled to a bit nonsensical. The first form of Solaris is at least distinctive. It's got an eagle-like head and clear body structure, the final form gets weird. It doesn't really feel like you're fighting a creature, more like a floating statue. Now, don't get me wrong, this is imposing because, again, it harkens back to that Lovecraftian idea, but I think we could improve this at least on a visual standpoint. Something that paves the way for new storytelling directions and narrative symbolism. How do we do that? Well, what if we pulled inspiration from creatures from our own mythological history? What if Solaris was based on the phoenix? In Greek mythology, the phoenix is along 
long-lived bird that cyclically regenerates or is otherwise reborn again. Associated with the sun, the phoenix obtains new life by arising from the ashes of its predecessor. With Solaris being the symbol of the sun in the story, it lines up perfectly. Not only is it something that matches the iconography of the sun, but this creature also rises again from the ashes and becomes new, meaning it lasts throughout time, much like a god of time would also function. This makes sense in terms of the structure and makes Solaris more sturdy than they were before, while also laying interesting groundworks while rethinking the story and the elements that would play in hand into the inciting incident, the characterization of the protagonists, and the overall themes and tones that this story will achieve. Second, let's talk about Solaris's goal, and by situation would be Mephiles's goal. I wanted to see if we couldn't do something a little different when it comes to the plan that Mephiles is trying to do within the story. Keeping in the idea that Solaris was angered by the events of the Solaris project, it would make sense that Mephiles would want to take some sort of action against the creatures that had torn them into pieces. The goal of Mephiles makes perfect sense, and in hindsight, you even understand where Mephiles is coming from. But because we're changing the concept and image of what Solaris actually was slash is, I decided I wanted to see if we couldn't shift Mephiles' goal as well, in terms of what Solaris actually intends to do when they're whole again. Or at least, mostly whole again. There was this whole concept and element around rebirth that follows the idea of the phoenix, so let's channel this into reimagining what Mephiles wants to do that makes it a much more interesting interpretation of what you'd imagine an antagonistic force to do. Narratively, the changes really start taking effect right at the beginning of the story, where we learn a little bit of history about the Festival of the Sun and what it's about. Rather than just being the celebration of Solaris, the Festival of the Sun now acts like a ritual in plain sight. The sun ceremony still plays out mostly the same. Elise makes her way to the center of Soliana to bring forth this everlasting flame. But rather than it just being symbolic, what if there was an actual reason for this? When the Grand Torch is ignited, the people of Soliana treat this flame like it is Solaris. So what if it was? At least, what if it was a part of Solaris? Something that, at least once a year, is given the chance to breathe so that for another year, it remains dormant. Which begs the question, if it stays out, what will happen? After all, if you let a fire breathe too much, it'll grow. What about this three-way split idea that I mentioned before? What does that mean? Well, it's actually quite simple. Rather than Solaris only being split into two pieces, being Iblis and Mephiles, we're going to split them into three pieces. The power, the mind, and the soul. I'm sure some are curious as to why I'd be doing this. Well, this idea started when I posed the question at the start of the segment, talking about the alignment of Solaris, asking whether or not they are actually evil. Iblis is defined as the raw power of Solaris, but a beast without a purpose is, well, mindless. Iblis doesn't have a goal or a plan. It's just a wild animal trying to survive. Mephiles, on the other hand, is described as the cunning mind of Solaris. The only reason why they can't enact their plans is because they lack the power to do so. But notice that there's a problem still hanging around. If you removed the power from Solaris, which then creates Mephiles, wouldn't Mephiles still be considered benevolent? Why does removing their power make them evil? Simple, it technically shouldn't. You could take the happiest person on the planet, remove all their luxuries, and they would still be happy. Remove their compassion, however, and you get somebody who becomes cold, heartless, unable to see things from another perspective, unwilling to see how their actions could benefit other people. Mephiles isn't evil because they lost their power, they're evil because they lost their compassion. Solaris has been split into three pieces in this version of the story. The body, the mind, and the soul. There are a lot of elements throughout human history that showcase this concept of the body, mind, and soul, and how they help illustrate and showcase how someone maintains a balance within themselves. And by allowing this third element to exist for Solaris, we now have a deity that, when whole, they are the entity that these people of Soliana would look up to, as someone who would watch over them. Each one of these parts is just as important as the other, but if any of them are separated, the balance is thrown off, and things could easily be thrown into a calamity. So, let's take a moment and talk about naming conventions with an etymology lesson. Don't worry, this ain't gonna be any sort of test after this. I just want to give you some information to understand about this new element that I'm including and why I did it. First, let's talk about the names of Mephiles and Iblis. For those unaware, these names aren't random and actually have historical meaning in religion. The name Mephiles is derived from the demon in German folklore named Mephistopheles, who originally appeared in Faust literature legend, and acts as a 
stock character of a version of the devil. The word Mephistopheles has a few different word sources, most attributed to two Hebrew words, Mephits, meaning the disperser or scatterer, and Tophel, which means liar, making the word Mephistopheles roughly translate to the disperser of lies. This makes perfect sense on two fronts. One, Mephilus is a character of demon-like physical and mental qualities, and second, Mephilus is a character who performs a series of lies to make the protagonists think that they are on their side. Now the name Iblis is much more directive, as is the personal name of the devil in Islamic texts. To many scholars, Iblis is regarded as a jinn, the origin word being for the word genie. Jinn throughout most historical instances are thought of being indifferent beings. They're neither evil nor good. In concept, this lines up with Iblis fantastically, because Iblis in and of itself does not have a personality. Like we said, it's a wild animal capable of great destruction. So, because we're splitting Solaris into three pieces that include Iblis and Mephilus, what does that mean for this third piece, the aforementioned soul of Solaris? Well, I wanted to continue with the German element that was seen in Mephilus, so I started to do some translation work. As with most languages, there are a bunch of different variations for the word soul. The one that I found and will use for this particular piece is Inerst, a German word meaning soul, literally translating to innermost. This is the compassion of Solaris, what makes them care over the people of Soliana over the countless generations. When they are whole, they form an all-powerful being capable of protecting Soliana while also existing in the past, present, and future simultaneously. But if the mind, who has become a void of any compassion, were to reunite with the raw power of their past selves, with no regard of what their actions could do to those who once worshipped them, who knows what the world is in store for? Perhaps they believe that, just like how they are reborn in fire, perhaps this world should do the same. Now, we'll return to this when we get to the actual rewrite section as a means to showcase a little neat narrative reveal. In the meantime, let's talk about time. Literally. You might want to sit down for this one. So, you want to write a time travel story. You got a stellar idea that's sure to knock everyone off their feet. You sit down to write it, and then you realize that time travel stories are one of the most difficult things to write on the planet. Sonic 06 did not need to have time travel in its story. Solaris could have easily just been the god of sun or fire, but no, they're the god of time, and that means some time-based hijinks are in order. The problem is, Sonic 06's usage of time traversal is weirdly utilized and surprisingly broken. Time travel plot are really tricky to do because of all the rules, clauses, outcomes, paradoxes that you either have to reference or make up for your story. The time travel in Sonic 06 does not have any defined set of rules or even a cost. Seemingly, characters are able to just jump to any point in time without any consequences. Seriously, listen to this actual clip from the game. There's still a way to change this. If we return to an earlier point in time, we'll be able to save her. I understand. What in heaven's name are you talking about? Where's the sense of risk? All the potential stakes go right out the window when you can just jump to whatever time that you want. Time travel needs to have consequences, both in terms of how it affects the story as well as the characters who are using it to move through the story. Where's the danger in knowing that if you aren't careful, your actions could make things worse than they already are? So how could I make time travel fit into this particular rewrite? I propose a small change that makes a world of difference, being that the power of Solaris is the only thing that's capable of time traversal. It is not something the Chaos Emeralds are capable of doing. Allow me to explain my reason. Here. It's mentioned by Eggman at the end of the last story that Solaris is, quote, a transcendent life form that exists in the past, present, and future, which means that Solaris exists in a non-linear time movement. Now, this sounds a tad complicated, so allow me to use an analogy. Linear movement would be like a one-way road. You can only go from point A to B with no going back. Yesterday becomes today, today becomes tomorrow. This is how normal time progression works. Non-linear time movement is like a train track with station A 
on one end and station B on the other. When you're on the train, you have the ability to go from A to B, B to A, or anywhere else you wish to go on this line. However, there's a catch. You, as somebody on this train, cannot travel beyond the designated points. You can't go past the stations on either side. With me so far? All right. One concrete rule that establishes time travel element in this story is, as we put it, is understanding where the stations are located. Iblis and Solaris are not the same thing, which means that if you had Iblis in your control, the furthest back you could go was the day of the Solaris project when Solaris was split into its different parts. Any point after the Solaris project reaching all the way into the future when Iblis is defeated is your timeline. If Silver has a clash with Iblis in the far future, it means that he can only be transplanted back into a time point that Iblis exists as well as where Iblis is located. The train rider cannot choose where they end up on this line. If you want to ride the train line, you have to be on the train. He goes back in time to a general location to where Iblis is, just in the past, which is why he shows up at the Festival of the Sun, because a version of Iblis was there at the festival. One of the biggest and potentially controversial changes I'm going to make revolves around what Elise is in this narrative. Now, she still has a connection to Solaris, but we're shifting it a tad. She is still a host to a part of Solaris, but it's no longer going to be Iblis. Iblis is going to be trapped inside of something else. I've revised this script over nine times now, and this was actually something that only recently hit me like a ton of bricks. If you want to house a flame in something, there are usually a couple things that come to mind. A lantern, candles, a bonfire, but one thing that stood out to me was actually something we saw a brief image of in the original story. When Elise goes and lights the Grand Cauldron inside of Soliana, she uses a very particular item, a super ornate torch. What if the flame in this torch was Iblis, but remains dormant because Elise is present? The Festival of the Sun is actually a means to allow Iblis to breathe. If they don't perform this ceremony once a year, they risk the torch breaking and they have no ability to keep Iblis contained. Similarly, if they don't return Iblis back into the torch by the time the sun rises, Iblis could awaken and grow to an even grander size with no soul or mind keeping it in check. What we're doing here is keeping the idea of an item or an artifact that is capable of housing a piece of Solaris. In the original story, it was the Scepter of Darkness that kept Mephilus at bay. This also allows us to have another particular element that actually showcases how the Solaris project ended up happening in the beginning. Long before the Solaris project, Soliana would partake in the Festival of the Suns as a means to honor Solaris for watching over them. This much doesn't change. If anything, because we're basing Solaris on the Phoenix in this rewrite, the festival is actually how Solaris is reborn once a year. Solaris's true form is a pure white flame that's housed inside of this torch. Once a year, the flame slowly reduces in size, showing that the flame is dying out. The current ruler of Soliana takes the flame, lights the Grand Cauldron, and this is where they grow to an immense size, and this is how Solaris is reborn. This is a tradition that's held by every generation to the crown of Soliana, that is, until 10 years ago. The first time Princess Elise is given the chance of transporting Solaris it's done as a test to make sure she can handle the responsibility. The Duke performs a switcheroo and doesn't actually have Elise light the Grand Cauldron with the Flame of Solaris. Instead, they take it to the laboratory inside of the Castle Soliana. Now, the idea that the Duke wants to use the power of Solaris to traverse through time is something you can actually choose whether to implement or not. It's a real bummer to say this, but it was such an incredibly lazy plot element from the original game that is just unapologetically thrown into the second to last scene of the game that, as it it turns out, the Duke of Soliana wants to traverse through time so that he could either see his wife again or potentially save her from her own death. Yeah, this super important detail to understanding what the Solaris project was actually about was given to the audience in the second to last scene of the entire game. That is not fair to us, and it certainly isn't fair to the characters who have to deal with this ridiculous narrative twist right at the very end. Now, I should address that this idea that the Duke wants to use this power to save his wife is not a bad concept for motivation, but if you're going to do something like this, actually address it earlier in the story. It doesn't need to be right at the start, but it sure as heck should not be at the very end. Anyway, detour over. The Solaris project begins, it goes wrong, and Solaris is broken into three pieces, the power, the mind, and the soul. Now, two of those pieces end up binding themselves to the characters of royal lineage. Now, I can already tell there's a few of you who might have an idea of what's going on here. Patience story, people. We'll get there soon enough. But the 
thing that didn't bind itself to any one person was Iblis, who now remains still trapped inside of the torch. After the death of the Duke, the torch can now only be handled by Elise. If somebody else tries holding the torch, the flame turns a deep red and whoever's holding it is burned and has to release the torch. From then on, for the next 10 years, the Festival of the Sun plays out like it used to. The current ruler, in this case Elise, takes the torch, lights the cauldron. After the festival is over, the flame rests for another year. I'm sure some of you are wondering, well, how does this play into the idea that time travel is possible with the Torch of Iblis? Well, because it's the raw power of a god of time, if Iblis could be controlled, that means the holder of the torch could use that power. But, and this is what makes it crucial in restraining the overpowered nature of time traversal, it is only achievable by somebody who has a connection to Solaris. Now, this begs the question, if she can hold the torch, can Elise traverse through time with the Torch of Iblis? Not at the beginning of the story, no. You need to be careful about how you implement these powers. The problem with giving her these powers from the start is that it breaks character progression. Elise should learn that she has these powers and as well learn how to eventually use them. Up until this point, these dormant abilities were just something she'd never needed. After the inciting incident, this kicks off the events that allow her to grow in multiple values. This gives her a personal goal that coincides with the narrative, and like we said before, time travel should always cost something. Traversal of time is unnatural and should be treated as such. If Elise begins to develop these powers, they should be costly. Perhaps every time she initiates time travel, she's temporarily knocked unconscious when they return to the present. There are a bunch of different things that can be done to make time traversal cost something, so let's hear some of those ideas that you've got. In the comments, start off with time traversal ideas and talk about what concept and, well, ideas that you have for what the toll of time travel should be. But what about the Chaos Emeralds? I hear somebody typing out. Can they still be used to travel through time? <sighs> Look, the Chaos Emeralds suddenly being able to traverse through time is something I'm not a huge fan of. In this version of the story we're working on, I'm opting to not give the Chaos Emeralds the ability to time travel. Now, do the Chaos Emeralds need to be removed in their entirety? Not at all. If you plan on keeping the Emeralds around, that's perfectly fine, but try to find some way of making them more narratively interesting other than the typical, we need these to save the day, that has become a little bit too much of the norm. Originally, the power of the Emeralds was about empowering the user. For for example, what if Mephilus is actively hunting Chaos Emeralds this time around? Not to become powerful like Perfect Chaos in Sonic Adventure 1, but as a means to fuse back with Iblis so that way they can cause the world to be reborn in endless flames. This allows the Chaos Emeralds to have purpose within the story while also being unique to this narrative. I mean, Blaze even says in this game that these are gems that transform your thoughts into power and that when you collect seven of them, a miracle is supposed to happen. This is something that we can use to our advantage in this rework. With that super casual segue, let's talk about Blaze. It is no secret to anyone who knows me personally, but I might as well say it now. Blaze the Cat is 100% my favorite character in the whole Sonic franchise. She's got a strong sense of determination, she knows how to keep cool despite her fiery powers. She feels like she's been through stuff, despite only being roughly the same age as everyone else. That said, I don't like her inclusion in Sonic 06. It has nothing to do with her character, it has everything to do with her being in the story. Because she has no purpose or reason to be here at all. Why is she in the future with Silver? Why is she not back in her own dimension? Why does she either know or not know who Sonic is? Does this take place after Sonic Rush? Before? Is this a completely different timeline because the game was supposed to be a reboot of the series? There are all these questions that go unanswered and just leave Blaze in this weird void of just being there that just feels like so much of a letdown. It's made so much more sour when you realize that the only reason why Blaze is here is because she can control fire. She's the only one at the end of Silver Story who can be accepted by Iblis as a new host and then take Iblis into another dimension. Yeah, she's only in this game to die. Worse yet, apparently it didn't even work. Her ultimate sacrifice goes completely null and void. One of the more strange answers to one of these questions comes in the form of a 2012 Sonic Boom Q&A panel with Takashi Izuka. Izuka's translator was quoted as saying, Silver is from the future and Blaze is from an alternate dimension. In Sonic 06, everyone, referring to all the characters that should seemingly know one another, had, like, amnesia. <sighs> 
I really don't like this. Randomly giving a character amnesia is a super lazy cop-out for why said characters don't know something or someone. There really are so many different ideas that could have been done. Instead, it's just, oh, they forgot this super important detail, which is just code for, oh, the writers didn't properly explain something, uh-oh. So how do we fix this? I have an idea for crafting something that not only allows us to explain a reason for Blaze being in this dimension, but also gives her something to do as well. We know that the Solaris project was done by the Duke of Siliana in an attempt to harness the power of Solaris. The project fails, Solaris is broken into the three pieces. What if the project did something else? Solaris is a god of time who was experimented on, a being that, at their full potential, could warp the line between dimensions. Perhaps these experiments actually opened up a small window, just long enough for someone who, sensing the growing flames, would inquire as to what was going on. Someone who has a connection to fire, sensing the impending flames that could send the very fabric of time into peril. It gives Blaze an understandable reason for entering the narrative. Instead of just having this strange plotline where Silver and Shadow go into the past to help seal Iblis and Mephilus into Elise and the Scepter of Darkness, respectively, it's Blaze who's brought into this dimension when Solaris was torn apart. It makes sense as to why someone with pyrokinesis would be the one to help with a broken flame-based deity. She arrives in this dimension when the project fails, helps Elise and the Duke with their situation, but is never able to get back home. After all, it was Solaris being broken that brought her here, so now that Solaris is no more, how does she get back to her own dimension? It's something we will tackle in the rewrite when we get there. For now, let's talk about the final point that we're going to focus on. When you have a large cast of characters, there's a lot of stress to make sure that everyone has a good amount of screen time that justifies them being in the story. Throwing a bunch of established characters whose definition of being involved is that they were already characters in the franchise, it just leaves them aimlessly wandering around with nothing to do. Apart from Rouge needing assistance from Shadow to escape Eggman's base in White Acropolis, what do all the other side characters do, exactly? How did they get here? It's something in this story that just ends up pulling a hey, insert character name name. You're here too, huh? And it just feels so uninteresting. If we're supposed to view this as a reboot of the series, that means that in a writing standpoint, we have no idea who these characters are to one another. You should try to find a way to show and tell us what we need to know about them. Not a whole backstory, just enough to get us to understand who they are, why they're here, at least a general connection to the other characters in the narrative, as well as what they provide to help move the story forward. Literally every single single one of these characters has a unique attribute to them. None of them should just be standing around on the sidelines. Tails is an engineering prodigy and a strategist. Knuckles has an intent of hunting sense and lives for excavation. Rouge is a skilled thief who can find her way into any security system. Omega is a walking tank with supremely advanced AI, and Blaze has mastered the art of pyrokinesis. The only real odd one out narratively in Sonic 06 is Amy Rose, but even then she could be useful when paired with another character. She's got a pico hammer. Find a creative way for her to use it. Giving everyone a chance to shine during the main story makes the wide cast of characters feel inclusive. Rather than them just being there for the sake of being there, we now have a foundation that at least allows everyone to play some part in the narrative. It promotes teamwork that utilizes the divide and conquer strategy effectively, allowing both characters to stand in the spotlight while also allowing us, the player and audience, to have a wide selection of playstyles if you want them to be that way. Sonic 06 randomly allows you to take control of of Tails and Knuckles and Sonic story, Rouge and Omega and Shadow story, and Blaze and Amy and Silver story. But with these changes allow us to make a more organic transition if the game decides these additional characters should be playable. It's a little carryover from Sonic Adventure that does a lot for variety and narrative direction without forcing it to be the next Sonic Adventure game. While I get it was supposed to be a reboot, I want to use at least some narrative elements from previous entries to help for a spot of influence. Small stepping off points for narrative structure. So, one last thing I need to address before we get properly started. I'm writing this story in a general sense, which means that I'm focusing on the narrative flow from the perspectives as they intertwine. I am not doing a full read write of all three stories. I can already tell you that this video is already too long as it is, and doing all three stories would just pad the runtime. Instead, we're focusing on the main elements of the narrative as a whole. This includes the main plot points from each story on their own, as well as when 
when they intersect from the three perspectives. When I write a scene where two of the main characters are there in that scene, I will note that there are different connotational elements from each perspective, focusing on making sure that you see all sides of each of the perspectives. Multiple perspective story narratives should not show the exact same scene over and over again with no changes. You need to show that character's perception of the events dictates how that information is given. Little continuity elements go a long way to make these stories feel like their designated characters that the player is playing at the time is worthy of that perspective. So when I'm writing a scene that has two or more of the playable characters in that scene, I'll do my best to highlight on each one of the perspectives. So from the top, let's run down what we're doing. Birds of Soliana, Solaris the Phoenix, Time Reconstructure, Blaze's Purpose, everyone's got a job to do. And he's not going to do it alone! What is happening? ABC is too lazy to do it himself, so he enlists the help of his friends to do it for him! Why do I do this to myself? It's two for the price of one! It's Rakujo Morame and Zero Kami! <laughs> Huge thank you to my two friends, Rakujo and Zero Kirby. Seriously, I kind of thought I could do all of this on my own, but seeing the timestamp of this video, eh, a little help would be nice. Wash your hands, everyone. It's time to begin the operation. We start in a dark, barely visible apartment. The only light that flickers is from small cracks in the curtain over the window. A gray hedgehog sleeps quietly with his face into the cushions of a couch. Suddenly, the room rumbles. The hedgehog turns and looks over at the window with one eye open. He groans. The hedgehog raises his hand, which begins to glow a teal hue. The ceiling is covered in push lights that all begin to glow, and then like a wave, all of them are pushed and turned on, all except one. The room is filled with literature, books, newspapers, papers, magazines, each style of literature is organized by type. What dominates the room are the sheer amount of potted plants of varying shapes and sizes. Here is where his narration begins. I'm told that the world used to be better than this. The hedgehog gets up off the couch. He wanders over to where the light went out over in the ceiling. He raises his hand. The light twists and slowly lowers to his hand, enveloped in the teal glow. Vast oceans as far as the eye can see. Hills of green that would roll into the sunset. He walks over to a cabinet on the other side of the room. He opens a drawer and replaces the batteries within the light. I even read stories about the other worlds, written by people with wonderful imaginations. But the one story I can't seem to figure out, no matter how hard I look, is what happened to this world. He tosses the light over his shoulder, which glows teal and zips back over to the empty port on the ceiling and turns on. He walks over to a closet holding a collection of water jugs and bottles. He reaches in and retrieves a small watering can. I try and find something that would help connect the dots, but I can never get a clear picture. He walks over and waters several plants. After a moment, he puts the can back in the closet and closes it. Whenever I try to ask about what happened back then, I never get a direct answer. The hedgehog walks over to the curtains. He stares at them before he reaches forward. I'm always told the same thing. He grasps the curtains and pulls them aside, showing a city engulfed with black clouds, embers rising as ashes fall. The roads are alive with blood-red flames. The buildings and skyscrapers rise with the piercing glow of the heat below. A blue wind arrives on the Festival of the Sun, where the world ignited and the flames begun. The hedgehog slides open the window. The heat surges into the room, rustling papers and sending the curtains dancing. He steps onto the lip of the window. He's engulfed in that teal glow and leaps out of the window, soaring into the sky. Just as he disappears, a teal glow forms around the windowsill, and the window slides shut. The hedgehog flies from building to building, seemingly looking for something. He turns to see someone standing atop one of the skyscrapers. He flies over and lands on the roof near them. The figure looks out over the edge of the building at the fires below. We only see their silhouette. The hedgehog goes over and stands next to them. They both gaze out over the fiery vista. Silver, says the figure. Silver turns to them. Yes? The figure turns to look off the side of the other buildings. They're loud today. The flames? Silver follows the gaze of the figure over the city. Yes, louder than ever before. The figure turns to Silver, revealing themselves to be Blaze the Cat, but not the Blaze that we know. This Blaze is much older. Her purple fur is filled with gray and white strands. Her face has grown tired with time. In the center of her golden eyes are hints of white. This Blaze is blind. She wears a collection of brilliantly colored rectangular gems around her neck, almost seemingly sparkling from the flames below. The two of them converse about how a beast will awaken today. 
Saturday. Silver says that they will stop it just like they always have. Blaze reminisces that she knew other people like Silver, always moving forward despite the odds. Silver hesitates, but finally asks, what causes the flames? Blaze says that knowing what caused the flames won't extinguish them here and now. She explains that they need to focus on what is, not what was. Silver doesn't really like this answer, but he's really not one to argue. Blaze explains that the flames are calling out in both anguish and in triumph, which confuses Silver, as he thought the flames didn't speak in words. Blaze does confirm this. She holds the gems around her neck, saying that the gems allow her to hear what the flames are feeling, but doesn't know why the flames are making the noises. She tells him, These flames consume this world because they are empty. No soul or spirit to guide them. Blaze says that if these flames are in anguish and in triumph, perhaps it was because the flames didn't know if this was the day that they win or lose. Blaze proposes that perhaps they should make that choice for them. Silver nods and asks where they're to go. After a moment of listening, Blaze points off into the distance. Silver steps forward and holds out his hand to Blaze, who instinctively takes it. They both glow in that teal aura, and they take off in the direction of Blaze's pointed hands. It's here that the game could segue into the first level of Silver's story, or perhaps it could have been when Silver left the apartment. Have an idea for what this level could be? Leave it in the comments with Silver Level 1. Let's hear those plans for some gameplay. A giant lake of lava pools in a giant crater between the collapsed buildings. Silver and Blaze land near the edge. Not a moment later, the earth begins to tremble. Silver looks around for the source, but Blaze's eye line was directly into the center of the lava. It's time, she whispers. In an instant, the sounds of the flames become silenced, almost as if time itself stood still. And then, from the lava lake, an enormous creature bursts from beneath the surface, a bird-like creature of immense size. Its body looked like it was made of molten metal. Its wings were dripping lava that were incomplete looking. The beast lets out a screech that pierced the air, shattering remaining windows nearby. Silver and Blaze briefly talk about what they're going to do to keep the beast at bay. Silver collects nearby debris and flies up towards the beast. Blaze raises her arms, which glow with heat. The lava around the beast hardens, restricting its movements. It's here that the player would have their first boss battle against this beast. This time, it's both Silver and Blaze working in tandem to take down the enemy. The battle is intense. Silver is giving it his all to try to subdue the beast. As time goes on, Blaze's hold on this beast gets weaker and weaker. After a while, Silver lays a devastating blow, knocking it over. Silver turns to see that Blaze has collapsed. He flies down and helps her back up. It's too much. Blaze says, sweat dripping from her face. It's okay, I can handle it. But Blaze shakes her head. It won't stop, Silver. The sounds are everywhere. They're ringing into my head. It's too much. Blaze gets to her feet and faces towards the beast as it starts to get back up again. Determination comes over Blaze's face as the gems around her neck begin to glow. It's too much noise. Blaze swiftly moves towards the edge, overlooking the lake of lava. Blaze, what are you- Blaze looks up into the face of the beast who now stands at their full height. Blaze stretches out both hands in opposite directions. The gems fly off the necklace and form a floating circle around Blaze's outstretched hands. In an instant, they begin to spin at incredible speeds. Silver's eyes widen as he watches the flames coming off of the beast were now getting sucked into this spinning gem vortex and were being absorbed by Blaze. The beast's screeches becoming quieter and quieter. Silver tries to move forward to intervene, but just like a candle being blown out, the beast vanishes. All of the fires around the city instantly go out, leaving the world in total blackness. Blaze? Silver's eyes try to adjust to the sudden darkness. There was a moment of silence before it was broken by the sound of Blaze's voice. I see it. Blaze turns to face towards Silver. Her once purple fur is now charcoal black. From the tips of her hair dance these little flames. Her eyes glowed in the darkness. In her open hand was a small red flame that seemed almost motionless. Find him, Silver. Silver stares into Blaze's face. Follow the wind. Blaze shuts her hand around the flame. A piercing light engulfs the entire city. Silver raises his arms to cover his eyes. It was too bright. Everything was going white. There was nothing but whiteness. And then something curious happens. Silver hears a voice. Excuse me. Silver opens his eyes and looks around. He's standing in a water fountain in the middle of a large plaza surrounded by white buildings. He looks up to see a brilliantly blue sky full of fluffy white clouds silently moving in the soft breeze. This is his 
his first time ever seeing a blue sky. Uh, sir? Silver turns to see a guard dressed in a suit of white attire with bits of armor. Would you mind getting out of the fountain, sir? Uh, please? Silver blinks and looks down at his submerged feet. Oh. Silver bashably walks over to the side of the fountain. I I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. He climbs out of the fountain, splashing the guard with the water following his feet. Oh, I'm sorry. Silver freezes when he hears someone giggling. He turns to see a girl accompanied by another guard. She had stunningly red hair and was dressed in a beautiful dress that sparkled in the sunlight. First time in Soliana, I presume, she says. Silver looks around the plaza, then back to this girl. Yeah, I guess so. Well, Traveler, I hope you enjoy your stay for the festival. The guard nearest Silver turns to the girl. Speaking of which, Princess, you need to get ready. <laughs> the princess smiles and rolls her eyes. I'm already wearing the dress. What more is there? The guards escort the princess away, but Silver steps forward. Wait. The princess turns towards Silver. What festival is this? The princess smiles with a raised eyebrow. The festival of the sun, of course. Silver's eyes widen as the princess turns and departs with the guards, leaving Silver standing in silence as the plaza fills with the citizens of Soleana. Okay, first part of this reworking, and we're starting off with some pretty heavy changes, so let's talk about what they were and why we're doing them. Narratively, it makes sense to start off in the distant future to help set up elements and consequences for actions that have yet to pass. Honestly, I wanted to pull more references in the apocalyptic trope in this first sequence that we see the day in the life of an apocalypse survivor. Very much in the same vein as I Am Legend or Wally, -E, as it shows us how these characters are living in a world that has fallen into oblivion. We're working on making Silver a proper character with actual history and personality. Giving Silver a mystery to solve drives his motivation in a much more personal way than I need to save the world because I have to. More than anything, Silver just wants to know the truth of what happened in the time before this era of flames he lives in. He's doing his best to try to piece things together by reading books, magazines, newspapers, which we show the audience in the apartment that he sleeps in. We're shown this visually by taking advantage of this show don't tell element within story writing. Secondly, we get to see who Silver is, and I mean really see who he is, rather than just being told who or what he is. We've established that he's somebody who really likes to read, or at least does it to pass the time and find out more about the past. Additionally, I really like the idea of giving him this hobby of botany, the art of planting, as it's just one more thing that connects him to the past before the flames covered the world. I'm pulling massive inspiration from the titular character from the Hayao Miyazaki 1984 film Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind for this new version of Silver we're working with. Someone who's finding elements of the past that forward their progression. I feel that makes him much more of an interesting character to follow than the typical I'm doing this because I have to because it's my destiny and it gives much more room to work with in terms of how we write this story. Now, if you wanted to have Silver's narration, you could. This sequence would totally be just as effective without any of the narration, as everything you need to know about Silver is conveyed visually to the audience. For me, I kept the idea of narration because it made a little bit more interesting opportunities for additional exposition. Again, the way this scene is played is totally up to you as the writer. All right, let's talk about the cat in the room. Why did I choose to make Blaze older in this? Honestly, the story element of Mephilus finds Finding Silver and Blaze in the far future and doing the typical big lie trope is both extremely cliched and isn't executed very well in the original version. I wanted to see if we couldn't do something that revolved more around Blaze instead. Now, I'm sure some will ask, if Blaze was pulled into this dimension by the Solaris Project Crisis, how could she possibly be here in the far future? Wouldn't that make her over 224 years old? There are two ideas that I'll focus on with this particular idea. First, Blaze was one of the only characters that could have survived after the crisis. She is someone who has the power of pyrokinesis, and while it isn't pretty, she's literally designed to live in a landscape like this. Second, because the flames are directly tied to a god of time, Blaze was also affected by it. Time does not affect her the same way as it did before. Strangely to bring it up again, think about what happened to Samurai Jack in the 2017 revival for Adult Swim. There, the titular character spends 50 years in the future, but remains 
remains the same age, lamenting that time has lost its effect on him. Blaze is not in her original dimension. She was brought here, and now she lives in a world where the god of time has lit the world on fire. Does Blaze age? Yes. Does she age very slowly? Yes. Is it because of Solaris, or is it because she's not in her own dimension? That is completely up to you in terms of structure, as they're both equal in their purpose. What would you do in this particular situation? Leave a comment with the title Blaze Age, and let's hear about your ideas. I'm sure some of you have noticed that I never name drop who or what the beast is. Yes, I am doing that intentionally, as I want to focus on the idea that this is an ancient evil that is deliberately nameless. To Silver, that's all this thing is. A flamebringer. That which has no characterization or soul. It's just an entity, a beast, a monster. Blaze also probably has a good reason as to why she's keeping that kind of information to herself. Getting back on track, does Iblis need to remain nameless for the rest of the game? Not at all. I'm just purposely keeping it nameless at the beginning of Silver's story. It's when Silver goes back to the past that he finds out what the name of this beast is, or at least he finds a word that works as a name. Now, at the end of Silver's original story, Blaze suddenly showcases that she has the ability to be a host for Iblis and she casts herself into a different dimension so that this world would be free of the flames of disaster. Waiting until the very end is not a great idea, just because it feels like it comes out of nowhere. What we're doing here is showing this ability right from the beginning of Silver Story so that way we can convert this to memory. This is a thing that certain characters are capable of doing, and we'll remember that as time goes on. I went ahead and saved the I see it line from the original game and repurposed it here. However, Blaze isn't seeing Sonic, she's seeing Iblis's timeline. Using our analogy, this is the moment that Blaze in the future becomes aware of this time train analogy. By forcefully extinguishing Iblis, she causes a reaction that sends Silver to the present day, in proximity to where Iblis was at that point in time. Also, and this one is purely just for the fans, I'm using Blaze's prototype concept art for inspiration for when she becomes the host of Iblis, with a few tweaks here and there. Would most people notice this? Probably not. Would some? Yeah. And they might be uh, getting quite a, quite a kick out of it. Alright, let's get back into this. Silver's in the present day, and Soliana is about to get their party on. It's the evening of the Festival of the Sun. The citizens of Soliana have gathered around the coastline to watch the sunset. Standing on a boat at the edge of the river that flows into the city was Princess Elise, holding an unlit ornate torch in her open hands. The crowd quiets as the sun slowly shifts onto the horizon. Elise holds the torch towards the horizon. Once the sun has disappeared over the edge of the ocean, a flame bursts from the torch. The citizens of Soliana roar with cheers and applause as Elise turns with the torch held over her head. The boat then travels through the castle town. As citizens follow along the walkways, other boats with dancers and performers gather behind the main boat as it moves towards the center of the city. The river opens up to a large body of water, where a grand cauldron sits just upon the surface, in the middle. As they approach the cauldron, Elise looks over at the crowds. She notices a father and daughter dancing to the music being performed. Elise dons a sad smile. One of the guards notices and steps forward and asks if Elise was alright, to which she confirms. She turns back to face forward as the boat stops at the platform just in front of the cauldron. The music and chatter of the crowd silences. Elise steps forward off of the boat and stands before the Grand Cauldron. She turns to face the city and holds the torch high above her head and out towards the city. We give thanks for this blessed flame, a tribute to Solaris for guiding and watching over us. We take this flame to show you we are here. Elise turns towards the cauldron and takes a deep breath. She steps forward and tilts the torch over a pedestal. The flames leap forward and race around and illuminating the cauldron. The lamps and torches all around the city illuminate with with flame, bathing Soliana in light. The crowd cheers as Elise exhales in relief. She turns back towards the city and raises her hands. The crowd silences. Solaris, Elise calls out, holding her hands up to the night sky. We give our gratitude for lighting our way from the past and into the future. May we always continue to have peace under the light of the sun. There's a pause. Elise lowers her hands and looks over at the citizens. She smiles. Let the festival begin. The crowd cheers and applaud and the music begins to start up again. Elise steps back on to 
into the boat, taking the hands of one of the guards for support. That was wonderful, your majesty, says one of the guards. Thank you. Even after ten years of this, I'm always afraid I'll forget something, Elise says, smiling sheepishly. Would you like to go to shore now? Yes, I must find out what's making that delicious smell. The festivities are in full swing. The citizens of Soliana share in food, drink, songs, and dance. Elise walks around the festival, her guards always at her side. She converses with many different types of citizens, trying all different kinds of food along the way. Nearby, taking the chance to enjoy the festivities as well, Silver was walking around, marveling at the sights and smells. He had only ever seen food like this in magazines. He had never imagined he'd be standing in front of somebody who was making it right before his eyes. The thing that caught his eye the most, though, was the pasta. What? This takes place in a place that's based off of Italy. It's based in Venice. I gotta show some Italian representation. What? He watches the vendor cook the noodles as a random citizen would choose what different types of sauces and toppings they want. Eventually, it was Silver's turn, and he really didn't know what he wants, so he casually just asks for one of everything, collecting a smorgasbord of different kinds of pastas, sauces, and bread, all on one plate. Silver moves to a clearing and flies up to the edge of a rooftop and sits down. It's a small little moment of him eating food. It doesn't have to be long or drawn out. It's a small little breather for a character whose world just got flipped upside down. While he enjoys his little makeshift cuisine, he's taking in the sights and sound of the city below. He watches Elise return to her boat and taken back to the Grand Cauldron. Just as he reaches the platform, the crowd falls silent again. Elise looks out over the citizens of Soliana. We take this moment of silence to reflect on our past. By the light of Solaris, our ancestors were guided here to set roots deep beneath our feet so that we could stand here today. We give this moment of silence to Solaris. May you guide us into the future. Elise lowers her head. All of the citizens lower their heads. There's a moment of stillness in Soliana, but just then, there was something. Elise opens her eyes. There was a strange noise getting louder and louder. The citizens begin to look around as well. Elise turns her gaze to the sky. A giant airship descends over the city. It was the cause of the noise. Suddenly, a crashing noise is heard from behind the cauldron, followed by screams, then another crash, and then another. Something was falling from the ship in the sky. The guards call out to Elise, beckoning her back to the boat. Elise moves towards them, but just as she's about to reach them, the guards are flung into the water as a strange robotic creature lands on the boat. She gasps when robots drop down from all around her, trapping her on the platform. At a brief moment of panic, she looks around, looking for some kind of escape, but then she looks up at a different noise. A pod from the airship was lowering and hovers right in front of the cauldron platform. A large man with a thick mustache and glasses presents Elise with a deep bow before standing upright. A pleasure to meet you at last, Princess of Soliana. Who are you? Elise asks, doing her best to stand tall. I am Dr. Ivo Robotnik, your majesty, a renowned scientist, inventor, and- Robotnik is cut off as Elise steps forward, a look of determination coming over her face. Why are you here? Robotnik smiles. <laughs> I admire your tenacity, princess. Robotnik looks out over the citizens being grouped together by the robots. There are many stories talking about what happens during this little festival of yours. Quite the party, if I do say so myself. Robotnik turns back to Elise. I've come to acquire knowledge about the flames of Solaris. And who better to learn from than the Source? Silver stands on the edge of the rooftop, looking down at everything that's going on. Should he intervene? Does he have any right to step into affairs that aren't his own? Every time he's about to leap out and do something, he stops himself. Silver looks out into the distance in concentration, but something strange catches his eye. He wasn't sure what it was, but whatever it is, it's coming this way. And fast. Elise nervously glances around at the citizens being huddled together. She looks back up at Robotnik. This way! Please, Robotnik says, gesturing to his pod. Elise's eyes dart from side to side. What should she do? Just then, there was a swift breeze that ruffled her feathers, followed by a loud thunk. Elise and Robotnik turn to see a robot standing on the boat slowly tip over and fall into the water. Whoosh! Thunk! Three of the four robots surrounding Elise suddenly fall into the water. Whoosh! Elise turns to face Robotnik and is puzzled by what she sees. Standing next to Robotnik is a blue hedgehog, who's staring at the back of Robotnik's head. Robotnik sees that Elise is staring at something, and he turns to see what she's looking at. But in the blink of an eye, the hedgehog appears on the other side of him. Robotnik whips around to look, but the hedgehog was gone again. Elise feels a tap on her shoulder. She turns to see that the hedgehog was standing right next to her. Is he bothering you? The hedgehog asks. Robotnik turns, and his face is flush with rage as he points at the hedgehog. You! He exclaims. The hedgehog turns to Robotnik with a raised eyebrow.
Zero. Not you, Eggman. I'm asking her. Elise Splinks. Eggman. The hedgehog smiles. Yep, that's him. Is he being his usual annoying self? Eggman grunts angrily, clenches a fist, and commands the robots to attack the hedgehog. The hedgehog looks over at Elise, rolls his eyes with a smile. Suddenly, he vanishes. The sounds of whooshes and thunk happen all at once, and just like that, the hedgehog was right next to Elise again. All of the nearby robots suddenly tip over and fall off the platform and into the water. Eggman groans again and slams his hand down onto a button on his console, rocket ports opening up all over his pod. Uh-oh, says the hedgehog, stepping forward and picking Elise up. Pardon me. Whoosh! Elise gasps as she's instantly carried across the platform just as rockets launch and explode where they were just standing. They hop from boat to boat off to the shoreline and take down the walkway. Eggman sits down onto his chair on his pod and massages the side of his head. Curse that little blue rat! Eggman shifts his attention over to the platform, where the torch that was used to light the cauldron was resting on the pedestal. He presses a button on his pod, sending an arm forward, retrieving the torch and bringing it to him. He examines it for a moment before pressing another button and the arm stores it into a compartment inside the pod. He reaches over and presses a different button on the console. Keep your eyes peeled. They can't be going too far. Eggman's pod rises to join with the giant ship above. The robots around the street begin to usher citizens into the building before standing in front of the door, clearing the streets and quarantining everyone in different buildings. Silver stands atop a nearby building as he turns his gaze towards the egg carrier, then turning his face towards the blue blur dashing through the city streets. Elise watches as the lamps whip by as she's carried throughout Castletown. They come to a stop in an empty plaza. Elise is set down, blinking rapidly at the sudden decrease in speed. The hedgehog apologizes for the sudden retreat, saying that Eggman's got the flair for the dramatic. He looks up and points the top of Elise's head. Elise reaches up and feels that a few of her feathers are poking out randomly, so she quickly smooths them down and stands up tall, clearing her throat and thanking the hedgehog for helping her, to which he smiles and shrugs. No problem. Miss... He raises an eyebrow. Princess Elise of Soliana. Ah, jeez. The hedgehog's eyes widen as he snaps his arms to his side and bows slightly. Sorry for carrying you off like that, your majesty. Elise chuckles. <laughs> it's quite alright, you saved me back there. Um, mister... The hedgehog looks up and smiles. Call me Sonic, your majesty. Meanwhile, Silver floats down on a nearby rooftop and slowly leans forward to look over the edge, down at Sonic and Elise standing in the middle of the empty plaza. What are you up to? Down in the plaza, Elise looks around at the emptiness with a worried look. I'm concerned about my people, Sonic. W why would Eggman invade us like this? Sonic shrugs. Dunno, we only got here shortly after he did. Elise turns to Sonic. We? She asks. Just then, a small red biplane swoops over. A small radio falls to the ground. Sonic zips over and grabs it just before it hits the ground and zips back over to Elise. Hey, Tails! How's it looking from up there? Sonic says into the radio. Partly cloudy with a chance of egg showers. Robots everywhere, and I'm really hoping that egg carrier hasn't seen me yet. Um, how about you? Sonic looks over at Elise. Well, I saved a princess. Add that to the list of things I never thought I'd get to say. What's everyone else doing? Okay, Knuckles and Amy are making some tunnels underground so that the citizens will be able to escape soon, but we're gonna wait until we get the go-ahead. For the moment, I'd say just keep the princess out of sight for a bit until we figure out what Eggman's actually doing here. Sonic looks up at the egg carrier. After a pause, he turns to Elise. What was Eggman saying to you before I got there? Elise places a hand under her chin, looking up at the egg carrier. He said he wanted me to go with him so that he could learn about the flames of Solaris. Sonic raises an eyebrow. Solaris? Our guardian. They watch over the kingdom of Soliana. Elise gestures to the curved S-shaped necklace. They are Soliana's strength. Elise reaches up and taps a hairpin on each side of her head. Spirit. She reaches over and taps the other pin on the other side of her head. And so, Sonic nods. And the flames? Elise points towards a large flame in the middle of the city. The source of Solaris's powers is personified by the flames. Ah, source of power. No wonder Eggman wants it. Tails' voice pipes up. It's textbook, Eggman. If it's powerful, he wants it. Elise shakes her head. But the flames can only be moved by somebody of royal lineage to Soliana. Sonic points to Elise with a raised eyebrow. Including you. Elise's eyes widen. That's why he wanted me to go with him. Sona looks back up at the egg carrier. I bet the eggster's got something on that ship of his. But we're all kind of busy. There's a pause. Finally, Tails says, Well, we do have those contacts at gun. Sonic smiles with an exaggerated eye roll. If you can convince Shadow, by all means, go right ahead. He never answers any of my calls. Tails laughs. Yeah, yeah. I'll see what I can do. Stay safe, Sonic. You too, Tails. Sonic turns back 
to Elise with a smile. Well, I guess we just gotta work on staying out of sight for a while. Elise looks back up at the sound of the biplane. Who's Tails? Sonic looks up. My best bud, mechanical genius, and my eyes in the sky. Sonic looks back to Elise. Come on, we need to get you somewhere safe. All right, on the rooftop, Silver is mulling over all the information that he just heard. A blue wind on the Festival of the Sun. Could that guy be what she was talking about? His concentration breaks when he overhears that Sonic and Elise were planning to leave. Silver panics and looks over the edge. Without even giving it a second thought, Silver raises his hand, which begins to glow. Just as Sonic and Elise are starting to walk away, Sonic stops abruptly. Elise turns to see that Sonic is holding his radio at arm's length, which is curiously now glowing a teal color. Sonic raises an eyebrow and tries to pull on the radio, but both his arm and the radio remain perfectly still. He reaches out with his other hand and pulls with all of his might, but the radio doesn't budge. He lets go of the radio and it just hangs motionless in the air. A blue wind. Sonic and Elise hear a voice from above them, and they look up to see Silver floating, suspended, in the air above them, his silhouette pulsing with a teal glow. I didn't think it was that literal. Sonic steps forward in front of Elise. And you are? Sonic asks. My name is Silver. I've been given the chance to find the igniter of devastation. Silver points towards Sonic. The wind who allowed the fires to grow. Sonic blinks. He turns to Elise. You get any of that? Elise silently shakes her head. Sonic turns back to Silver. Uh, sorry. I think you got the wrong guy. Sonic looks over at the floating radio. Cool trick, though. So, uh, yeah, we're gonna get going now. Sonic turns to leave, but is suddenly enveloped in a teal glow and freezes in place. The radio falls to the ground. Not so fast. Silver's hand was now pointed at Sonic. I'm giving you one chance to be absolved. Tell me what you're going to do. How did you- Silver trails off as he glances over at Elise, who's staring right back at him. There's a pause. Elise tilts her head to one side with a raised eyebrow and quizzically points at Silver. Weren't you the one standing in the water fountain earlier today? Silver dons a nervous expression and after a moment he just clears his throat and looks back at Sonic and lowers his hand. Sonic is suddenly able to move again. Silver looks away from both Sonic and Elise. I don't know what your plan is, Igniter, but I will find out what happened here. Silver immediately rises from the street and disappears over the rooftops. In a brief moment of silence, Elise Elise and Sonic turn and are about to question what any of that was just about. Just then, a group of robots drop down into the plaza. Well, that's our cue. Sonic picks up Elise and they take down into an empty alleyway. Silver lands on a nearby building. There's a pause, and then he suddenly exhaled and slaps a hand to his forehead. What did I just do? I don't have proof of anything. Why did I say any of that? Silver says exasperatedly. He begins to pace on the roof, pacing back and forth. Okay, okay. Think, Silver. Even if this is the igniter, they just say a princess, so they can't be that bad, right? Silver stops pacing. But Blaze said that when the blue wind arrived, the flames begun. So, does he do something that causes the flames intentionally or by accident? Suddenly, Silver flinches as a fighter jet screams across the sky. He looks up to see this jet was flying directly towards the egg carrier. Silver squints to read the letters G-U-N printed on the side of the jet. He raises an eyebrow. Now what? Alright, let's analyze this section. First and foremost, we're changing Elise somewhat significantly. We're giving her a little bit more of a backbone that shows that she's capable of leading a kingdom, but also establishes that she has a personality. And having a moment at the start that showcases this goes a long way. She knows that when she needs to, she's the voice of authority. But in the years of peace that Soliana has been in, has left her a little blindsided to having something unexpected like this happen. She's presented with a hard choice to make. Stand as the crown of Soliana or surrender herself in the hope that her people will be safe. Perhaps an older ruler would have made this decision more swiftly, but she's young and has ruled over a kingdom that really hasn't had any form of conflict. It shows that while she's willing to throw on a stern persona, it's not something she's used to and she has a hard time making those tough calls. The second element change was the structure of the Festival of the Sun. I wanted to actually take the time to showcase the celebration, as it both shows how Elise interacts with the people of her kingdom, but also gets the point across that Silver's taking in the fact he's in the past and he's really admiring what it used to be. We're giving proper time to these two new characters to the series that doesn't hurt the plot progression in any way, and just gives us a chance to learn who they really are. Sonic and the crew have arrived, and we've established that everyone
Tails actually doing something important now. Sonic is no longer just doing things on his own, instead he's using his speed to act like a recon, a first responder to a crisis. And then there's Tails, as Sonic puts it, as the eyes in the sky is flying around in the signature plane the tornado. He's able to scope out things from above and get the general layout of the situation to help formulate a plan. Knuckles and Amy are working on getting the citizens safely undetected out of the city, and as the conversation between Sonic and Tails sets up the next scene, that Shadow and Rouge are arriving on the scene, emphasized by the fact that the gun jet shows up over Soliana. Everyone is doing something and is actively driving the narrative forward in a way that doesn't command the spotlight of any one character. They're all working as a collective element. So why do I have Silver and Sonic meet this early in this rewrite? Simple. Rather than it just being a series of coincidences and inconveniences, we're just getting to the point. Having Silver be distracted by Amy in the original story didn't do anything other than pad the runtime and halting Silver's progression. If this is an end of the world level situation, I'd imagine that Silver would probably jump at the opportunity at getting ahead into what he believes might be the cause of the everlasting destruction he came from. If he sees an opportunity to stop the flames from spreading, he might just jump at the opportunity. And that's what makes Silver's quest so much more impactful for Silver's development. We're not given a character that's just gung-ho about potentially killing somebody. Rather, we're given somebody who's trying to figure things out for themselves. He sees a blue blur enter the scene, and of course he's going to jump to conclusions. He's not playing with a full hand of information. It's notable that Silver jumped to conclusions with labeling Sonic as the igniter. He has no proof of this. He assumes this because the stories he had been told say that the flames began when the blue wind arrived, so he's connecting the dots that were available to him. What contradicts this assumption that he had is when this supposed igniter saves somebody, which spawns even more questions. Did Blaze make her description of the past ambiguous for a reason? If so, why? His whole motivation of confronting Sonic was not planned out. He saw an opportunity and he took it, only really reflecting on his own actions after he had already done it. And who knows what that could have done? For all Silver knows, confronting Sonic the way that he did may have just caused the spark in the first place. It leaves a lot of questions in his mind that he needs to figure out for himself. Jumping back into the rework, we take to the skies as a gun jet speeds towards the egg carrier high above Soliana. A sleek black fighter jet swiftly dives underneath the egg carrier. As it passes by, several turrets rise from the surface of the egg carrier and begin to fire away at the jet. The jet suddenly pulls up, rising high above the egg carrier, way over atop the city. The jet rolls, and as it does, two figures are ejected from the bottom. Tails, flying his biplane around the city, turns towards the two figures in freefall. The two characters land on either wing, a bat with white fur and another hedgehog, black in color with red quills. Nice catch, Tails, calls out the bat. Thanks, Rouge, Tails says, turning to the hedgehog. Thanks for the help, Shadow. Shadow nods and looks down at the egg carrier below them. Tails runs down what everyone else is doing while also explaining why they need to get into the egg carrier and find out what Eggman's plan is. Rouge smiles. Good old fashioned breaking and entering? Count me in. Shadow looks down the length of the egg carrier before locking his eyes on one particular port. We can get in from there. He points down at a bay door that was opening, letting robots fall down onto the city below. And just for good measure, Tails reaches into a compartment behind him and pulls out a stunningly green jewel. Whoa, Rouge says, her eyes twinkling. You just carry a Chaos Emerald around, huh? Well, I plan on making it a backup energy source, but I think I'll be fine without it for a little while. Tails hands the jewel off to Shadow. Here we go. The biplane dives down. As they approach the egg carrier, the gun turrets turn and fire at them. Tails rolls the plane into a tight spiral to evade. As they approach their opening, the bay door begins to close. Right as they pass by, Shadow reaches out a hand, holding the Chaos Emerald to Rouge, who grabs onto it. In a flash of green, the two of them disappear and reappear on the other side of the bay door, just as it snaps shut. Rouge shrugs. That wasn't so bad. Shadow looks around the cargo bay. It's not gonna be that easy in here. Let's go. Rouge smirks. I'll work, no play. The pair of them take off down a passageway into the depths of the egg carrier. This would be a fun little place for the first level in Shadow's story, the infiltration of the egg carrier. It would use both Shadow and Rouge's skills to get where they needed to go, while providing interesting 
interesting shifts in playstyles. Have an idea? Let us know with Shadow Level 1 down in the comments below. What cool and unique ideas do you have for this first level featuring Shadow and Rouge? Eventually they find themselves into a computer room and they make their way inside sealing the door behind them. Rouge goes over to a computer terminal, plugs in a small little device and proceeds to search the computer for any details she can find. Shadow walks around and looks at the things scattered around the lab. He comes to a large tank filled with black smoke that twists and turns from the other side of the glass. Okay, Rouge says, opening up documents on the computer, accompanied with images of Elise and an older looking bird in a lab coat. Soliana, City of Water, current monarch, Princess Elise III. She ascended to the throne ten years ago when the previous monarch, the Duke of Soliana, was killed in an experimental energy solutions test that went wrong. Shadow turns to Rouge. Anything on this so-called Flame of Solaris? Rouge scrolls down the page, skimming over the documents. Well, it looks like Eggman's been using that doctorate of his. He's actually done proper research. After a pause, Rouge exclaims. Okay, I, I found some of Eggman's notes. Here we go. Solaris, worship deity of Soliana is described as the holder of the sun. When referring to Solaris, the Solian in text refer to Solaris as being three parts that watch over the kingdom. Iblis, a word meaning strength, heaves the sun across the sky, making day into night, night into day. Mephilus, meaning the mind or sometimes spirit, sees into the passage of time to help guide those who have lost their way. Finally, and nursed, the soul is the compassion of Solaris that continues to watch over and protect Soliana. Shadow looks around the lab. I doubt new vocabulary was on Eggman's to-do list. Rouge clicks through a few notes. Oh, Eggman's left a voice note on this one. Thank goodness his handwriting is dreadful. Rouge clicks a button on the keyboard. From the computer, Eggman's voice is heard. Once a year, the kingdom of Soliana participates in the Festival of the Sun, a celebration of all things Solaris. The monarch takes a special torch to the coast, and when the sun sets, the torch is alit with Solaris's flame. The citizens say that she's capturing the sun itself, but that's preposterous. The monarch brings the flame into the heart of Soliana, where the grand cauldron is lit with the flame. It's here that Solaris rests until the morning, and the people of Soliana pay respect to Solaris through celebration. At dawn, the monarch takes the flames and returns them to the horizon, where the sun will appear at the edge of the ocean, continuing to watch over the kingdom of Soliana for the next year. The flames of Solaris are said to contain the power of a god who can peer into the flow of time itself. The question is, can that power be taken? Just then, the door to the lab opens, a single robot standing in the entryway. The three exchange a look. The robot draws its weapon and opens fire into the room. Rouge and Shadow duck for cover. The ammo rattles through the room, hitting that container of black smoke. Shadow beads around, dashes from object to object, and knocks the robot out with a kick to the head. Uh, Shadow? Rouge says. Shadow turns to see smoke pouring out like a liquid from the holes in the containment glass and onto the floor. The smoke isn't spreading, but stays in one spot. After all the smoke is free from the container, there's a pause. Then, a figure rises from the middle of the smoke pool. It reaches its full height, and the figure takes a deep breath. The smoke surrounding its body and on the floor is absorbed into this figure like a sponge. Standing in front of Shadow and Rouge was a tall bird, wearing a lab coat and was slightly tattered around the wrists and hem. The white plumage was ruffled and appeared to be covered in ashes. Rouge gasps, but that's... They turn to the computer and look upon the image of the Duke of Soliana on the screen. Shadow and Rouge turn back to see the Duke of Soliana standing right in front of them. The figure lets out a deep breath. Blue embers and smoke rise from their mouth. They raise their hands to their face and examine them. The hands look like they're made of charcoal, flickering with blue embers and the occasional wisp of blue frame as they crackle in the quiet lab. They speak with a rumbling, echoing voice. Interesting. He clutches a hand into a fist, one after the other. As they were bound to her, I was bound to him. He looks up at Shadow and Rouge. How twisted fate can be. Shadow steps forward. Who are you? This figure raises his eyebrows. Who am I indeed? I am no longer who I was, nor am I the one I resemble. 
There's a pause. They look down at their hands again. I am a figment of who I was, a memory of who I am, and a promise of who I will be. A muffled spirit of the past, present, and future. They look at Shadow and flash a smile that is somehow both comforting and chilling. I am Mephilus. Alarms blare as the lab is suddenly flooded with emergency lights. Mephilus raises a hand to a wall. Black smoke and blue embers shoot from beneath his sleeves, cutting a perfect circle in the wall to the outside, causing the pressure inside the lab to change. Rouge and Shadow dash to grab onto items to hold on. As he reaches out to a desk, the Chaos Emerald slips out from Shadow's hand and flies towards the opening. Mephilus' arm reaches out. His hand shoots, disconnecting from his arm, reaching out, connected by a cloud out of smoke and reaches and catches the emerald. I watched over this kingdom for eons, reborn from the ashes to protect them, and what did they do? With his arm slowly shrinking in length, Mephilus casually walks over to the opening. With his arm back to normal size, he stares at the Chaos Emerald in his hand. They shattered me, and for ten years I was kept dormant. But if I can be reborn from ashes... Mephilus flashes that ominous smile again. Perhaps it's time for this broken world to do the same. In an instant, the image of Mephilus becomes engulfed in smoke and is whisked out of the opening. Shadow runs towards the opening, but the smoke was gone. Rouge makes her way back over to the computer and extracts the small device she plugged in earlier. She joins Shadow at the opening. They see Tails flying nearby in his biplane. Tails spots them and swerves towards the opening. Just as robots swarm the lab, Shadow and Rouge leap out and land on the wing of the biplane. Tails looks up at the opening that's being sealed shut by the robots. What happened? I saw smoke just then. W was there some kind of fire? No. Shadow says, looking back up at the egg carrier. That was something else. Tails looks at Shadow's empty hand. Uh, where's the Chaos Emerald? Tails turns towards Rouge, who just grimaces. Tails sighs. Man, today was going so well, too. Tails grabs a radio on the dashboard. Sonic, you there? Yeah, we're still here. We're someplace safe for the moment. Tails reaches up and scratches the side of his head. Uh, good, because th things just got a little bit more complicated. The biplane swerves away, taking off to over the city. What Tails, Rouge, and Shadow don't see is Silver hanging onto the bottom of the plane, looking back at the air carrier as he listens into the conversation that Tails and Rouge have as they recount of what just happened just moments before. Shifting Mephilus is definitely going to be one of the more debated elements for people, and while some may think it's a small change, others are definitely going to think it's kind of massive. I feel like I should clarify as to why I'm doing this particular change. The reason I want Mephilus to look like the late Duke of Soliana is because it has much more narrative tension that doesn't piggyback on the need for an inclusion of another character in the narrative. Simply put, the fact the fact that Mephilus looks like Shadow in the original story felt weirdly lazy? Oh, this villain looks like Shadow because he was resurrected within the Shadow of Shadow, making him the Shadow of Shadow Shadow. Ah, oh, my head. That's not good characterization. That just feels like a weirdly multi-layered pun. Additionally, I've also removed the idea of the Scepter of Darkness. I'm sorry, the Scepter just felt like this weird inclusion, whose setup is just, I was told to get this thing, so I got it. Oops. I broke it. Now this evil dude's wandering around. My bad. Yeah, I get why it's there, but isn't it a little weird that after the events of the Solaris Project going wrong, the Duke just has this really cryptically evil thing on standby? Why does he have it already? Why not take a moment of the narrative and explain why they have something like this that could potentially contain an evil version of the god you just ripped in half? Wouldn't it be just a little bit more interesting to have something that actually takes effort and time rather than just shoehorning it in there for some strange reason? My point is the scepter of darkness was just unneeded really it's just a strange thing to have that just sort of materializes in the plot for seemingly no good reason from that in the original story mephilus getting released just feels too convenient and his apparent distaste towards shadow doesn't feel like a revelation like it's played out to be it really is just sort of a oh he's angry because shadow put him in a bottle okay then and that is just such a killjoy because the way mephilus speaks about shadow when he first meets them narratively in the game 
game, you think Shadow did some unspeakable evil towards Mephilus, but no, in reality he's upset because he immediately got bottled in the most evil looking jar of pickles you've ever seen. Imagine the Solaris Project. Rather than Iblis and Mephilus being forced into Elise and the Scepter of Darkness respectively by other characters, the parts of the broken Solaris bind themselves to the two other characters in the room, Elise and the Duke of Soliana, as protective matter, like a parasite fusing with the host body. By making it so that Mephilus takes on the appearance of the Duke of Soliana means that the character has a much more impactful influence to their rivals in a more direct sense. No longer is this another hedgehog lookalike in a game slash story that already invented a new one. This makes the dynamic between Mephilus and Elise so much more interesting. A rival that is after something she is protected is now taken on the appearance of someone she lost when she was young, let alone having this person be her father. It provides interesting narrative inclusion that's not only structurally sound, but also has weight on the characters in the plot that actually makes much more sense and provides a building ramp of tension that becomes stronger the more that you realize that eventually this daughter is going to have to see the father that she lost all those years ago, but it's not going to be his voice she hears. And with that, let's jump back into the operation. A lone robot slowly patrols in front of a building. The robot suddenly sinks about half an inch down. Just as they look down to see what caused it, they fall into a hole. There's suddenly a surprise shriek and then a metallic whack as the robot soars out of the hole again with a giant dent in its head. After a beat, a pink hedgehog climbs out of the hole, dusting off her skirt. Knuckles, that's the fourth time you've missed the floor of a building. A red echidna pops out of the hole, rubbing his head, looking up at the pink hedgehog in frustration. I can't see the buildings when I'm digging, Amy. Give me a break, will ya? Amy looks around the street and brings a radio to her face. It tails? Tails you read? Yep, loud and clear. Amy looks at the building nearest them. We've done the outer limits and have started moving inward into the city. Uh, how are things up there? Well, Shadow and Rouge are snooping around the egg carrier. Dropped them off a little bit ago. Any word from Sonic? Uh, last I check, he's avoiding robots and keeping the princess safe. Amy raises an eyebrow. Wait, wait, like a, like a princess princess? Is there another kind of princess I'm unaware of? Amy frowns. Ah, Sonic gets to meet a princess and I'm stuck with Knuckles. Hey! Knuckles' voice echoes from the ground. Amy rolls her eyes as she looks back up at the sky. Is there anything you need help with? Nah, I'm good. You two just keep working on those tunnels, okay? Will do. Stay safe. Amy walks over to the hole and ground looks down. Coming down. Amy jumps into the hole. Not a moment later, a blue streak zips by and zigzags through the street before suddenly going through an open door and into an apartment building. Elise and Sonic speed into an empty the apartment. Sonic sets Elise down, zips over, and locks the door. Okay, fingers crossed we weren't followed. Sonic walks over to the window and looks around. Uh, did you know that silver guy? Elise shrugs. I mean, I saw him earlier today, but I didn't know him, or that he had ab abilities. Sonic looks back at Elise. Well, hopefully he's not gonna be a problem. Eggman's already going to be a pain. So, how do you know this Eggman? That is gonna be a long story. Simply put, Eggman's always bad news. So, anywhere he goes, we're always right behind him. Just then, Tails' voice is heard. Sonic, you there? Sonic pulls out the radio and brings it to his face. Yeah, we're still here. We're someplace safe for the moment. Uh, good, because th things just got a little bit more complicated. Okay, pause the rewrite just for a moment. Now, if you were playing Sonic Story, this is where you'd be given a rundown of the elements that just happened via dialogue exposition. Now, I'm sure someone's dying to type out, but isn't that telling and not showing our Aren't you all about that? To which I say, yes, it is, but you need to remember that this is something that, depending on your perspective, is all new information to you. In Sonic's story, he wasn't there with Shadow and Rouge when all of this stuff with Mephilus went down. You'd only be getting information at the same time as Sonic and Elise would, which would be in the form of dialogue. This is one of those things that actually plays into the hands of wanting to play with different perspectives. Realizing that the story we are given by Tails in Sonic's story is the TLDR version so that we'd be got up to speed, there's probably stuff that was missed or just flat out nixed from this version that Sonic was getting. Things that would become much more clear when you actually played Shadow's story. I'd imagine that Tails or Rouge would deliberately leave out the detail that Mephilus looks like the late Duke of Soliana, as that would probably be way too much for Elise to handle and comprehend given everything that's just happened to her. The goal is to never have unneeded dialogue that just recounts exactly 
exactly the same thing that was seen in the story branch that you are currently in. This is Sonic and Elise's first time coming to know what's happened in Shadow and Rouge's story, which is why Shadow, Rouge, and Tail recount what just happened while Sonic was running around the city to keep Elise safe. Similarly, if we're playing Silver Story, this would also be the same situation, except he's hanging underneath the underside of the biplane, listening in to the details that were given. In Shadow Story, because we witnessed this, it would just fade out as they begin to recap everything that just went on. That way, we still don't have any overlapping dialogue or have anything that recounts what just happened in the storyline that you are currently in. In Sonic Story, we're given a rundown of what happened via a conversation with Tails, Rouge, and Shadow over the radio. In Silver Story, he's hearing the same recap, but inconspicuously from underside the tornado. Now, could you write a scene where Silver follows after Shadow and Rouge into the egg carrier? Absolutely, but there's a specific reason why I'm choosing not to do that, and that's something that I'll talk about a little later. You should always try to think about how a character can receive information that isn't dialogue from another character. However, you must be careful to not rope characters together constantly, otherwise it just becomes too convenient and it can take you out of the narrative when you just say, oh, they just happen to be here too? Again? Find a balance of interaction and location for characters in the narrative at any given point in time. Alright, back into it we go. After the recap, Sonic turns to Elise, who's now sitting at a table, her fingers locked together as she ponders. Nephilus? She whispers. Uh, ring a bell? Elise rests her hands on the table. Nephilus is an ancient Solianan word, meaning spirit, but why would this person be calling themselves that? To sound scary? Sonic shrugs. Elise sighs. Sonic walks over and places a hand on her shoulder. Hey, we'll sort this out. Elise smiles meekly. Tails' voice pipes up on the radio. There's something I can't quite figure out. This Nephilus person said that they've been shattered for ten years. Didn't those files that you found say that Solaris project happened ten years ago, Rouge? Yeah, these records say that something happened inside the Royal Laboratory at the old castle in Kingdom Valley? Elise perks up at the words Kingdom Valley. My father's lab. Sonic turns to Elise. Elise looks out the window. Kingdom Valley is where the old Castle Soliana is. Elise turns and looks at Sonic with a stern look. But ever since the accident, I was never allowed to go back. Sonic raises an eyebrow. How about we go find out why? Elise nods. Sonic walks over to Elise, picks her up, and they zip out the door. From high above, Tails flies around the city with Shadow and Rouge on each of the plane wings. Shadow suddenly gets a transmission from his wrist, detailing that there were several break-ins at different GUN facilities. Agents at the raided bases said that they can't seem to find any sort of suspect, but there's a strange cloud of black smoke around. The last known sight of the smoke was heading towards the white Acropolis base. Shadow and Rouge glance at one another. Ah, that can't be good, Rouge says. She turns to Tails. Do you think you could drop us off at the edge of the city so we can get our jet to pick us up? Sure thing. Tails rolls the plane to the left and over towards the edge of the city. As the plane rolls, Silver lets go of the plane and watches it fly as he hovers over the city. He turns to see the blue streak in the distance, heading towards a dense forested area. Glances back at the Grand Torch. Right, follow the wind. Silver turns back and flies in the direction of the jungle after the blue streak. Showing what other characters are doing at any given point in time is not a hard thing to do. When done right, it doesn't take away any momentum from the story, nor does it impede on the narrative that you're trying to set up. When talking about a video game, the length of the actual game is mostly up to the player. Taking a brief moment to showcase what other characters are doing is something that helps you take a nice little breather. It helps us understand this world is full of characters that have their own things going on. It has a nice follow-up to what Tails said was going on that plays nicely into segueing into the next scenes that follow afterward. Now, I'm sure that there are always going to be somebody who says, but it's a Sonic game, isn't it supposed to be about Sonic? I've had a few people leave the same comment on the Sonic Forces episode in relationship to the same idea, that the reworked narrative was more focused on the Avatar character rather than Sonic, the titular character. While I understand the logic and the feeling behind this idea, one needs to probably remember that just because the name of the story shares something with the character does not mean that it's required to make the game only about them. Let's take a brief look back into the history of Sonic games with multiple protagonists characters within their narratives. Sonic Adventure had the game split between six different characters. In the case of Sonic himself, his role was about 32% of the game. Tails, Knuckles, and E-102 Gamma each had about 16%, and Amy and Big the Cat had 10% each. That means that 68% of this game was spent playing characters that weren't Sonic. How about Sonic Adventure 2? Sonic's gameplay was 20% of the game with six levels. Tails, Knuckles, Eggman, and Rouge were 17% of the game with five levels each, and 
Support Shadow only had four levels, giving him only 13% of the game. Heck, one of the few games in the Sonic series that actually evenly splits the narrative between the separate playable entities was Sonic Heroes. Each one of the teams had 14 levels out of a total of 56. Everybody, in terms of the teams, had 25% of the game to their own narratives. Keep in mind, that was for playable characters in those games. Now, I'm not suggesting that we have large swaths of cutscenes explaining what the other characters are doing at any given point in time. That would be a bit much. All this is doing is allowing the world to be fleshed out a little bit more than what we originally got in the original story, while also still giving priority to the characters who are leading their respective narratives. The protagonists of their stories stay as the focus. If you, as the constructor of this new version of the story, felt like the story would be better if you had the ability to play as these side characters, that's up to you to decide. A recommendation that would definitely be worth thinking about is what exactly playing as those characters would add to the game as a whole in terms of its narrative. Randomly taking control of another character seems like a weird menial task that feels like low-hanging potential, so pitch back some ideas that you have for everybody. If you have an interesting idea for levels or even side plots with the supporting cast of characters, start a comment off with supporting cast ideas. Let's hear about what those ideas that you've got are. Alright, let's get back into it. Sonic, Elise, and albeit from a distance, Silver are heading into Kingdom Valley to go find out more information about the Solaris project. This leads to one of the most interesting things that I think we are able to do with this rewrite that showcases that when time is messed with, weird things can go awry. Sonic and Elise run through the dense trees, zipping back and forth between the branches. As they run, they suddenly feel a strange sensation watch over both of them. Sonic's ears twitch. Did everything just get quiet? Elise looks around. No sounds, no bugs chirping, no wind blowing. It's absolute silence. That's strange, she says as the two of them continue through the forest. Above the jungle, Silver flies over the canopy. He stops in the air and spots a dragonfly that's flapping its wings furiously, but somehow it's frozen completely in place. He floats over to it. Curiously, the wings appeared to be flapping backwards. He looks off into the distance to see a group of towers rising out of the trees in the distance. He glances back at the dragonfly before taking off towards the towers. Sonic and Elise reach a clearing and come to a stop. They stand in awe at what they're seeing. In the middle of a pristine lake was a striking castle that seemed to rise from the lake's surface. Curiously, the castle was falling apart, but all of the destruction was frozen in place, completely unmoved. Yep, strange was the right word for this, Sonic says, Elise nodding in agreement. Directly above them, but just out of sight, Silver hovers in the air, staring wide-eyed at the same vista of the castle. Sonic and Elise speed off towards the castle, skipping along the lake's immobile surface and jumping through the falling bits of debris and into the castle's entryway and make their way inside. Silver waits for a moment before shortly following after them. Inside the castle, the motionless destruction was intense and very eerie. Sonic, still holding Elise, walk around the bits of falling debris. After a moment, he sets Elise down, but the moment her feet touch the floor, they're spooked as all of the torches nearby suddenly ignite. Strangely, all of the flames were green. Sonic looks at Elise, but she just shrugs, and the two of them begin to walk. Silver quietly follows after Sonic and Elise, <laughs> making the offhanded remark. Jeez, the igniter part was also literal. It's at this particular instance that you actually have an opportunity for a bit of back and forth conversation between Sonic and Elise. Similarly to when they have that conversation, conversation about what Solaris is in the original game while they're walking through the grass fields. This is your opportunity to have Elise talk about her family history just a little bit more. This time, we're making it much more personal. Mother and father would chase me up and down these hallways all day long, and I was always finding new places to hide and they'd have to come find me, but that stopped when mother got sick. Father spent a lot of time in his lab trying to find out what was wrong, but he never found an answer. Elise laments that her mother's passing affected the entire kingdom. Even the blue sky eyes turned gray for several days, like Solaris itself was sad at her passing. A year after her passing, when the Festival of the Sun was approaching, Elise recalls her father suddenly starting to work extremely hard on a project in his lab. The day before the festival, her father said that Elise was old enough to assume the mantle of Torchbearer, and that she would practice taking the flame to the laboratory in the castle, so that way she could better prepare for the festival when it arrives. The entire time, her father kept saying how much her mother will be proud 
proud, rather than saying would be proud. She never really understood why he was saying this, but she brought the torch to the lab like she was told. She performed the festival speech and lit a dummy cauldron that was, you know, making sure that she could do it correctly. At the time, the white flame lingered in the small cauldron, but just when her father flew some kind of lever, things went wrong. The flame started to shift and twist like it was being moved violently around like some kind of wind was pushing and pulling it. The equipment around the lab was going crazy and just like that, the flame went out. Just as the Duke moved towards Elise in the darkness, the cauldron exploded. Elise says that she remembers a flash of green before she was knocked unconscious. Elise pauses and says that that was the last day that she saw her father and that she was never allowed to return to the castle after that. Elise says that she never knew exactly what happened on that day. She turns to Sonic and tells him that it's time that she got some answers. Sonic and Elise's trip through the castle was taking a while to navigate. The debris was causing a lot more obstacles than they'd like. While Elise has memories of this castle, her memory of the castle's layout is spotty. They eventually come to an open door with the torches igniting when they walk by. Sonic looks into the room and says, Nope, not a lab. Sonic and Elise continue walking. Silver, still lacking behind, hovers down the hallway and peers into the room. It is an enormous three-floored library. Books from floor all the way to the high ceilings. Silver's eyes nearly pop out of his head. He's never seen a library this, well, unburnt before. He looks back at Sonic and Elise as they round a corner and looks back into the library. Well, books have never let me down before. Silver floats into the room and begins to pull books off of the shelves. At this particular instance, Silver and Sonic stories are happening side by side, but they aren't seeing the same thing. This is another element of branching narrative to show you different sides of the same story happening at the exact same time. While Silver gets his reading on, we follow after Sonic and Elise as they continue to roam. After a bit of walking, they eventually find themselves in a narrow passageway that eventually opens into a lab. In the center was a large pedestal that looked like it could have held a canister of some kind. The thing that stood out were seven gems on the floor. However, they didn't look like Chaos Emeralds. These were more rectangular and were placed on the floor in a circular pattern on the ground. In the middle of the circle was an enormous scorch mark. Elise suddenly begins to blink rapidly. Do you hear that? What? Sonic says. That voice. Sonic looks around the room, but Elise points to the mark in the middle of the gems. It's there. I, I hear someone. Sonic leans forward, his ear pointed at the mark, but he just shrugs. I'm not hearing anything. Elise steps forward and reaches her hand out. From the tips of her fingers, light green flames suddenly burst out. All of the gems on the ground suddenly twitch. Elise reacts and brings her hand back with a yelp. There's a pause. Are you all right? Sonic asks. That was odd, Elise says. She reaches out her hand again, but this time, when the flames appear, she doesn't flinch and keeps moving forward. The gems on the ground begin to spin rapidly, sparks shooting out from beneath them. As Elise continues to advance, the gems suddenly erupt with orange and yellow flames that spin into a tight whirlwind that reach all the way up to the high ceiling. Elise hesitates for a moment before taking a step forward and forces her hand into the fiery whirlwind. The color of the flames suddenly dance between green, red, and blue. Elise's eyes widen as she turns towards Sonic. Someone's grabbed my hand! What? Come on, help me pull! Sonic grabs Elise's open hand and the two of them begin to pull. As Elise's hand exits the whirlwind, there's a hand grasped tightly onto Elise's wrist. With one last pull, someone is yanked out of the whirlwind and the flames suddenly go out. In the sudden darkness, Sonic blinks and looks around. He sees Elise getting to her knees. He walks over and asks if she's alright. Before Elise could answer, the two of them hear another voice in the room. They turn to see someone standing on the other side of the room, facing the wall. What just happened? Said this new figure. Sonic eyes widen as he is staring at someone he recognizes. But that, that can't be right. She couldn't be here, could she? Blaze? Sonic says in a perplexed tone. Blaze turns around. Her eyes lock with Sonic's and just become as wide. Sonic? Sonic gets to his feet and walks over to Blaze. What? How did you get here? Blaze points down at the gems on the floor. The soul emeralds. Is this your dimension? Sonic shrugs. I mean, yeah? Blaze places a hand on her hip. So, you and Tails were able to get back after we defeated Captain Whisker. Sonic blinks. Uh, who now? Blaze raises an eyebrow. Captain Whisker. He was after the jeweled scepter. Don't, don't you remember? Sonic raises an eyebrow right back at her. I have no idea what you're talking about. Last we saw you, you were getting the soul emeralds back from Eggman. Blaze's hand drops from her hip. You haven't been there yet? She whispers. Just as Sonic is about to say something, Blaze's ears perk up and her gaze suddenly shifts over to Elise standing on the other side of the room. There's a pause and Elise looks a little uncomfortable at the silence, so she raises a hand and waves. Um, hello. 
Blaze stares at Elise before raising a hand and pointing at her. How did you get so big? Elise blinks. P -p pardon Blaze walks over to Elise, still pointing at her. You were just a child a few moments ago. Blaze points over at the scorch mark on the floor. You were over there. There was an explosion. You were hurt. There was a scientist asking for help. Elise's eyes widen. A scientist? Blaze brings a hand to her chin. While I helped with your burns, he took this fancy looking torch away. It was strange. It was deep red and the flame was making this weird noise. Elise turns to Sonic. If he had the torch, that must have been my father. Blaze continues to murmur. I waited for him to return, but the guards just came and took you away. So I tried to get home with the soul emeralds, but when I tried going back, I ended up here, which is where I was, but now it's not where I was. Elise steps forward. What else did my father say? Blaze stares at the scorch mark, now just flat out talking to herself. And those voices from the flames, they were loud and everywhere. It was Elise, frustrated, steps forward and reaches out to Blaze. Please answer my- Elise places a hand on Blaze's arm. Light green flames suddenly burst out from both Blaze and Elise and they engulf the entire lab. Blaze turns to see that Elise's entire silhouette is surrounded and shrouded in shimmering green lights. Elise turns towards Blaze, but a different voice is heard. Welcome back. What? Blaze calls out over the sound of the flames. There's little time, and I fear what is left won't be enough. Sonic steps forward and calls out. What is going on right now? Elise turns towards Sonic. Two of us are awake. The third will follow. Sonic is completely perplexed. He watches Elise's mouth move, but no words came out. What? I can't hear you, Elise. Elise blinks and looks down at her open hand. I'm afraid I'm not the one who I resemble. At least, not in this moment. Sonic looks at Blaze and just shrugs. Blaze steps forward to face Elise. Who are you? Elise turns back to Blaze. I am a figment of the past, a memory in the present to warn you of the future, a hopeful soul who's seen what is to come. Elise looks back at Sonic. A hint of Elise's voice can be heard. Make sure the princess gets the torch. Only she can quiet the rising fury. Elise turns back to Blaze. You will find someone new within the castle. Hold on to them. Make sure that they see that what they fear is not what will be, but still could be. Before either Sonic or Blaze can reply, all of the flames around the room suddenly rush back into Elise. Elise stands for a moment, but then falls unconscious and begins to fall backward, to which Sonic zips forward and catches her. Blaze and Sonic lock eyes. What was that? They both stare down at Elise. A warning, Blaze whispers. Just then, the castle begins to rumble. Bits of debris begin to fall from the ceiling. Okay, I guess someone hit play on the destruction button. We gotta go. Sonic says, carrying Elise towards the door. Sonic turns to see Blaze running towards the soul emeralds. Blaze places her hand in the middle of the circle formed by the emeralds, and in an instant, they shrink in size and form a bracelet around her arm. She begins to run towards another door on the opposite side of the room. Where are you going? Sonic calls out. Blaze turns around. There's someone in the castle I have to find. You get her out of here. I'll find you later. How? Blaze points at Elise. I'll hear her. Blaze turns on her heels and runs into the open doorway. Sonic shakes his head. Ah, I need to ask Tails if there's a word for stranger than strange. Sonic turns on his heels and speeds off down the hallway. Up in the castle library, Silver stands in a dark aisle between two towering bookshelves, reading a book on the history of Soleana. A small little reminder that this is happening at the same time of what's transpiring downstairs in the laboratory. Beside him are a series of open books scattered all over the floor. His open hand is facing up, glowing teal as it holds a torch high above them, lighting the dark aisle. In the book, in his hand, Silver reads a passage out loud. Soleana is a place of strength, spirit, and soul. On their own, one can do great things. Iblis carries our civilization without strain. Inerst guides us towards the future of promise. Mephilus keeps us who we are meant to be. It is when they are unified that together we are truly whole. Silver shifts his gaze to the opposite page, where a diagram containing three wave shapes is illustrated. One green, one blue, one red, stacked on top of each other to form a flame-like design. Above the design reads the mark of Solaris. Each one of the shapes has an arrow connecting to a little blurb. To the green mark, Ernest, the soul. The blue mark, Mephilus, the spirit. The red mark, Iblis, the strength. Silver looks up from the book and stares into space. He recalls what Blaze had said upon that rooftop. These flames are devoid of soul and spirit. Silver then thinks back to the little red flame that Blaze once held in her own hands. Iblis, Silver whispers. Just then the castle begins to shake. The bookshelves rock back and forward and begin to fall over. Silver raises both of his hands, freezing the bookshelves in place, but his concentration on the torch breaks and it lands on the stack of open books, immediately going up in flames that begin to spread to the shelves. Sweat from both the strain of the bookshelves and the rising heat, Silver grits his teeth. In a moment of pure desperation, he calls out, Help! 
help! Almost instantly, the flames all around him suddenly go out. Without the heat, Silver uses his remaining strength and shoves the bookshelves away. He catches his breath and hears a voice that seems familiar somehow. Are you alright? Silver turns to see someone standing at the end of the aisleway. But it can't be. That couldn't possibly be who it is, could it? Silver watches as this familiar character runs towards him down the aisle and stops right in front of him. Are you hurt? She asks again. Silver blinks and shakes his head. This character reaches forward and grabs Silver's hand and begins to pull him down the aisle. The castle's falling apart. We have to go. Silver looks up at a patch of ceiling that was falling right towards them. Look out! Just as the character looks up, Silver raises his hand. The fallen debris freezes in place with a teal glow enveloping it. The character turns to see Silver's glowing hand. Well, that's useful, she says, continuing to pull Silver underneath the frozen debris. After they pass underneath it, Silver lowers his hand and the debris falls to the floor. This character turns towards Silver and says, You got a name? Silver looks at her and blinks. It, Silver. She nods. My name's Blaze. As Blaze turns to face forward, Silver lets out a quiet, Nice to meet you. As he's dragged along by Blaze out of the collapsing castle. In the snowy regions of White Acropolis, Shadow and Rouge walk towards a small building buried in snow. A large red and black robot stands out in front of the door. It looks at Shadow and Rouge as they approach. Rouge smiles and places a hand on her hip. Long time no see, Omega. Omega bows slightly. No see is correct, Rouge the Bat. So, what's it like being in charge of security for gun? There's a pause. Omega lowers his head and raises his hand to pantomime a whisper. Boring. Omega takes a step to the side to show that the door was open. Shadow immediately walks through and into the building. Rouge follows after, but she turns to Omega on the other side of the door and asks if Omega would like to tag along. Omega tries, but he can't fit through the door. Rouge chuckles and tells him to just stand guard in the entryway. Rouge and Shadow walk through the station and they make their way to the storage area, where there's a suitcase resting on one of the shelves. Silver walks over, picks it up, brings it to his hands, and opens it, revealing a brilliantly colored teal gem on the inside. Rouge taps a small communication device on her wrist. This is Rouge. The emerald at White Acropolis is secure. There's no reply. Just as she's about to try again, a voice is heard in the room. Curious. The lights in the storage area all fizzle out, all except the one that Shadow and Rouge are standing under. Shadow looks around into the darkness, Rouge shifting over so the two of them are standing back to back. After a moment, the silence is broken. You two don't appear to be the normal agent type. Suddenly, two folders drop right at Shadow and Rouge's feet. They look down to see that both of the folders were documents about them. An outlaw in a failed experiment, working for an organization that once hunted them down. Shadow looks around the dark room. And who are you exactly? More like you than either of you could imagine. And what do you want? Rouge says. There's a quiet sigh in the darkness. Honestly, to go back to the way things were and forget this ever happened. Shadow flinches as he feels something standing right next to him. To be whole again. Shadow instinctively kicks into the air but making no contact with anything. There's another pause. Only one of those is possible now. And even then it would take a miracle. Shadow looks down at the suitcase in his hand, which now hangs open, empty. But I've heard these might be able to help with that. The lights in the room suddenly click back on. Shadow and Rouge look around, but the room was empty. Rouge's communicator begins to buzz, a voice saying, Rouge, come in Rouge. Have you arrived at the White Acropolis station yet? Rouge taps the communicator on her wrist. This is Rouge. The emerald's gone. Be advised, the subject is a creature who resembles the late Duke of Soliana in appearance and is calling themselves Mephilus. Shadow, Omega, and I will pursuit. Rouge looks over at Shadow. HQ's asking for our motive. Shadow looks down at the folder on the ground. The words, ultimate life form, branded right at the top. He turns and begins to leave the room. It just got personal. The horizon slowly grows brighter as Sonic returns to town with a now waking up Elise. They meet up with Tails, Amy, and Knuckles, all of which are standing in front of a fountain in an empty plaza. Tails is working on his radio, Amy walks over to help Elise sit down on the fountain ledge, and Knuckles is practically asleep while floating around in the fountain water. Sonic turns to Tails and speedily gets through all of the information about what just happened at the castle, the things that are frozen in time, the green flame, the lab, the whirlwind, and how Blaze is here now, and how for a moment Elise became something else entirely, and about how they now need to get to the torch to stop something from happening. Tails blinks. Yeah, that's a lot to take in. 
Elise stares at the ground while Amy places a hand on Elise's back. Are you okay? Elise nods and looks up at Sonic. We have to get back to the cauldron. Sonic nods, and the entire group follow after as they make their way to the Grand Cauldron. Upon arriving, Elise runs forward to the pedestal, but the torch was gone. She frantically starts to search, but then a booming voice is heard from above them. Welcome back, princess. They turn to see the egg carrier still hovering high above the city. Don't worry, your fancy torch is safe with me. I'd be more than happy to return it to you, in exchange for everything you know about Solaris, after all. Just then, the light of the rising sun peeks over the horizon, the beams landing on the Grand Cauldron. The yellow and orange flames now shift to a blood-red flame that now grows to an enormous size. All of the torches around Soliana begin to turn red as well. As the group stares upon the flame, Eggman's voice rings out. Who better to learn from than the Source? Blaze and Silver are walking out of the jungle's edge towards Castletown. Silver was still holding onto the book that he had from the library. He looks over at Blaze. You heard the voice of someone else coming out of the princess. Blaze nods. It was strange. I, I had heard that voice before, but this time it was only one. Silver raises an eyebrow. Only one? Blaze raises her arm with the soul emeralds forming the bracelet. When I first came here, I could hear two clear voices. One stern, one calm, but this time it was only the calm one I could hear. I couldn't hear the other one at all. But you could hear an actual voice. Blaze turns to him with a raised eyebrow. Yes? Silver looks down at the book at the mark of Solaris, focusing on the word Iblis. So it's not like before. He muttered. Blaze tilts her head to one side. Silver nervously smiles and shakes his head. <laughs> Sorry, just thinking out loud. Silver blinks as he looks over out at the horizon just as the sun begins to peek out. Well, there's still a few things we need to- Silver looks up to see that Blaze wasn't next to him anymore. He turns to see that Blaze was standing motionless a few paces back. Silver looks into Blaze's eyes that were wide with concern and he could see something reflected in them. He follows her gaze and turns around. His eyes widen as he sees the town in the distance where once the orange flames in the center had shifted to a blood red and was high above the rooftops. He's seen this flame before. I can hear it. Silver turns back to Blaze. The flame? Blaze nods and looks at the gems around her wrist. It's like the soul emeralds are translating. Silver takes a step forward towards Blaze. Are their voices? Blaze looks back at the flame. No, not voices, just feelings. Silver glances down at the book and focuses one last time on the word Iblis before looking back at the blood red flames rising high over the city of Soliana. And the flames begun. He whispers. This part acts as a means to structure a few ideas that will be carried forward into the rest of the narrative. Firstly, what Elise is actually capable of doing as a host of the Peace of Solaris as a very self-stepping off point into introducing us into the idea that Elise, with this power that she contains, is able to affect time within a certain parameter. It's nothing that should break the immersion, and most importantly, it's not designed as something to make her seem overpowered. What she currently did in this section was not something she intended to do she doesn't know what she even did. Rather than being predestined or based on a prophecy, we get a small little nugget of information about what she's capable of doing. The best part about how this works is that you don't actually know what exactly just happened. Was this at least tapping into the power of Solaris to do a seemingly impossible action? Was this blaze in the power of the soul emeralds that when interacting with a piece of Solaris, there was a very small instant where she was able to access the powers and abilities of Solaris, perhaps? Perhaps it was a little bit of both. That's the nice thing about setting things up for this interpretational element. You get to have moments where you're theorizing about what's going on rather than just being forcefully handed over exactly what's going on. You slowly get to build a case for yourself as to what just happened and will slowly begin to uncover the realization and the reality as time goes on within the story. And here she is, Blaze the Cat that we know and love has entered the story. And the best part about having her introduced in this way is that it does two things right from the get-go. One, we're getting Getting away from the idea that she somehow doesn't know who Sonic is. We're just addressing it from the start and we're moving on. Now, if you wanted to keep or have the idea of a situation where maybe her memory is lapsing and her history with Sonic is somehow muddled, there's some conflicting information going on with her that makes her believe that what she's seeing is not the same thing as what she understands it to be, or perhaps she just doesn't know him at all. All of these are indeed viable options if done properly. It allows the story to exist and outside of this pre 
stated qualification of being cemented into a series timeline. Again, the idea that Sonic 06 was originally supposed to be a reboot of the series, it makes sense for her to not technically know who Sonic is. However, just getting it out of the way allows the story to feel much more fluid and has a more smooth transition into the rest of the narrative. Now, the question should be asked whether or not this takes place between Sonic Rush and Sonic Rush Adventure, or potentially after both of those games, it's kind of up to the writer in question on whether or not they want it to fall between or after. For now, we're allowing this to exist after Sonic Rush in terms of its story. Blaze knows Sonic, Sonic knows Blaze. No need to make it complicated, no need to reimagine the wheel, just keep it simple. Secondly, we've gently established that Blaze has grown since the last time we've seen her in Sonic Rush. She's become much more comfortable with herself in terms of her abilities that personify her ability to control the Soul Emeralds, such as changing their size on command, hence the Soul Bracelet. But I wanted to see if I couldn't throw in a bit of a curveball. I wanted to see if we couldn't keep the idea that she was from the future, but we're tweaking it a little in that she's not from the far future. The Blaze who has entered this story is one who has already gone through the events of Sonic Rush Adventure, the sequel to Sonic Rush. I'm pulling humongous inspiration from the character River Song from the Doctor Who series for this reworked version of Blaze. For those who don't know or don't watch Doctor Who, I'll give a rundown. River Song is a character whose timeline with our protagonists is completely out of order. Every episode we see her in is almost never in chronological order. Now, I'm not going that insane with creating a deep interwoven time frame with shenanigans. This Blaze is just from a future that's right around the corner. I'm sure there are probably going to be a few of you that'll ask why I'd want to do that. Doesn't this just get overly complicated the more time goes on? To which I say, not really. Because while it might be a tricky idea to include, we're not going full River Song. It's only the concept of her being from a future that is slightly out of line from our protagonists in that they haven't been to this future yet. It doesn't need to be openly addressed or given a long stay within the narrative. The complexity does not need to go super deep. There's a comfortable beauty in this simplicity. The main reason why I want to do this kind of time travel element is honestly because it fascinates me. The idea that you'd run into people that you in present day haven't met yet but they know a lot about who you are or potentially somebody that you have known but they are a couple of days ahead of you and know what you're about to go through, it adds an interesting dynamic between the identities of these characters. Blaze being from the recent future contrasts with Silver being from the distant future that makes their interaction and friendship much more interesting to uncover. Silver never knew Blaze like this. His only exposure to her was when she was elderly, which makes matters so much more bizarre because he can't ask this Blaze for any of the answers to any of his questions because she's not that version yet and wouldn't be for quite some time. This is how I present the idea of solving the Blaze problem. Rather than it just being shoehorned in, we now have a strong connection for why Blaze is A, in the story that doesn't need to be too complex, and B, provides an interesting take on the character affected by time traversal and those interacting around them. She knows the characters that she's met in past installations, but she's from the near future that allows the protagonists who haven't been there yet to have a different dynamic. She was pulled into this dimension when the Solaris project failed, and she was the one who helped Elise and the Duke of Soliana. Whether or not she actually seals Ernest and Mephilus into Elise and the Duke is more subject to creative involvement for the writer in question. I'd imagine some would want to have Blaze do this, to have a small little arc dedicated to Blaze coming to terms with the fact that she may have unintentionally had a hand to play into the crisis that would slowly descend on this world. Others would think it probably would be too much of narrative importance to place onto a side character and would rather have the fractured pieces of Solaris fuse with Elise and the Duke respectively without Blaze's direct intent. This kind of thing is much more up to creative liberty, and I'm sure it's something that would be an interesting conversation to have on both sides for a debate. Now, I won't be doing a full-blown rewrite for the entire story in this video. I know, as much as I or even some of you would like me to, I know that this video would be nearly twice as long as my episode on the Secret of Nim. And believe me, my brain can only handle a couple of these every once in a while. Having these happen back to back was purely by accident. I'm rethinking my choices. So let's talk about our bullet points for what the potential narrative beats moving forward could be. Sonic's story is primarily going to be focused on keeping Elise out of the hands of Eggman. That much from the original story is still in play. The one thing I'm focusing on in terms of trying to change and remove is the amount of time that she gets kidnapped. Seriously, it was one of the funniest things to acknowledge how many times she gets kidnapped. 
Sonic just sets her down, takes three steps away, and she's immediately just swooped away. Several times. Really? Come on, man. Focus or something. The other objective is trying to get the Torch of Iblis back from Eggman so that Elise can try to calm Iblis from growing and, well, burning everything to a crisp. We have established right at the very end that Eggman does indeed know that Elise hosts a part of Solaris, which begs the question, what does he intend to do if he captures Elise? His research did turn up that Solaris is a god that can peer into the flow of time, so what does he intend to do with that? It's a question that's left in the hands of the writers to try to question and figure out. Perhaps the time element is just a cherry on top for a much bigger plan. What do you think? Leave a comment titled Eggman's Scheme Ideas and try to come up with a bunch of different directions Eggman could use Solaris in some way. With Princess Elise, her quest is to both find out how to save her kingdom while also uncovering how and why she's connected to Solaris and what exactly that means for both her abilities and as well as her own narrative. This story branch contains Elise and Sonic as our main protagonists with Tails, Knuckles, and Amy being the supporting cast that eventually bop in and out of the story when they're needed, with Eggman being the primary antagonist, and the threat of the flames of Solar slowly growing, becoming more and more unstable, and the looming danger that Mephilus is just around the corner and just out of sight. When it comes to the concept of time traversal in this narrative, I'm opting that we wait a little bit after the introduction of this story because there are a lot of story points that we need to get the story and its narrative moving forward. This also allows us to introduce time traversal slowly over time that builds both plot progression as well as character development for Elise. I could see a fairly neat interaction between Elise and Blaze later on in the story wherein they try to figure out the extent of powers and capabilities. Because again, who better to learn from somebody who's lived with pyrokinesis all of her life? Have an idea for this particular section? <laughs> I know I ask it a lot, but start a comment with Elise's progression and spitball some ideas as to how Elise could grow within the story, or her interactions with other characters as the story goes on. Shadow Story is about himself, Rouge, and Omega trying to locate and stop Mephilus from carrying out their goal. Rather than getting mixed up with Eggman, seeing as Eggman has a bunch of other characters to deal with, their focus is trying to get this mysterious character back. On this plotline, in this perspective, you learn the most about who Mephilus is, why they're doing what they're doing, and best of all, showcasing how they actually plan on doing it. Mephilus is indeed searching for Chaos Emeralds. They found this out when they went to the gun compound and it was broken into. They run into Mephilus again and witness him stealing a Chaos Emerald. The real question is, at this point, why is Mephilus looking into the emeralds to begin with? And what do they intend on doing when he has them? A fascinating story comes with Silver and Blaze. It's an interesting dynamic that he is now paired with somebody who he does have a history with, but doesn't have the same history with. The story of Silver and Blaze now gets to properly develop in a way that showcases who they are with one another, actually showing their friendship growing rather than it just being handed to us. In the original story, they were just sort of taped together in a very lackadaisical kind of way. There really wasn't any reason for Silver and Blaze to be partners or friends. Like we addressed earlier, Blaze being added into this narrative originally felt awkward because it didn't really feel like she belonged. With this new variation on the story, we've not only introduced her in a way that brings her into a proper state of being in the narrative, but it also allows us to showcase her abilities and how important they are moving forward in this story. Silver's story is all about trying to find out what actually causes Iblis to be unleashed, as well as what they can do to try to regain balance to both the situation at hand as well as the timeline that reaches far into the future. Sonic 06 was an example of a game that had unique ideas and concepts for a narrative, but at the end of the day there were just too many things that ended up causing an implosive domino effect. While most will look back on the gameplay and the graphics, the story is often overlooked because of how severe the other elements were. Some even go on to say the story was decent in comparison to the other things. Of course, that is always up to the opinion of the player and the audience. There will always be people throughout history that will find enjoyment in things where others did not. I've had many conversations with people who say that they enjoy Sonic 06 for what it was, and that's okay. You're allowed to like the game, or the story, or the movie, or the book for what it is. The concepts and ideas that we've come up here are not supposed to spark the erasure of the original. If rewrites of the original source materials were more commonplace in this idea, then we'd have lost most of the connection to classic works of famous writers in our own history because someone came along and either rewrote the original or made an adaptation. The driving motivation for this version of the story was to ask ourselves how we can take what was originally found in the original story and see if we couldn't help it stick the landing. Obviously, the story in any medium is only one ingredient of the mix. For a book, you have to worry about grammar 
grammar and writing structure. In movies, there's cinematography, sound design, soundtrack, editing, and in video games, there's graphics, the score, and the gameplay. These ideas were meant to show how, if it was just given a little bit more time to grow, they could bloom into a more wildly unique idea that both stand tall on their own and help build a foundation that it comes from. And while we may not have gotten that from what we had, we can still dream of what we could have had, and what we can still achieve as fans, as an audience, and as story writers. Thank you for watching this video of Story Surgery. If you managed to make it all the way here, no matter how long it took, I thank you from both the top and bottom of my story-driven heart. The script for this video was originally 62 pages long, and I was able to trim it down to about 44 pages. To put that into perspective, the video I did on The Secret of Nim was 29 pages long. Needless to say, I'm not doing another long video for quite a while. The next series of videos are going to be much shorter in comparison, and I've already got a general idea as what I'm going to be doing for most of them. I do really hope that people have taken the chance to comment their ideas with the sections provided. I always love reading what other people's ideas are, and I think that it helps promote a sense of growing creativity that helps us develop our story writing skills, it gives us a chance to jot down our own ideas, as well as brainstorm alongside others and find something altogether new. I want to take this moment and deeply thank Zero Kirby and Rakuja Morame for lending their voices in this video. The three of us have been friends for over a decade, and being able to bring friends in like this means the world to me. All of us have a very unique connection with Sonic the Hedgehog as a series, so it only made sense to bring them in for this bonkers ride. Special thanks to Spinballing over on Tumblr for allowing me to feature their fan art for this video. Their account is again listed in the description below, and I really do hope that you found their artwork as delightful as I did. Their design was a great stepping off point for helping design both Elise as well as the other citizens of Soliana. A huge thank you goes out to you, and I hope you keep on doodling. On the topic of artwork, I want to take a moment and focus on two people that actually did fan art of the Sonic Forces episode that I did. The first is Peachy over on Twitter. She made two wonderful illustrations of Phantom Sonic, the PCC on screen being one of them. I'd grab the original, but unfortunately her original account's no longer there. Come on Twitter, fix your stuff! Her and her boyfriend JC's Universe are two wonderful people and they're currently working on a fan comic entitled Sonic Reverse. It makes me really happy to see people putting their creativity to work to make something that they love. Go show them some support and I wish them all the best in their creations. And then I gotta talk about Discontented Fairy over on Tumblr, who did an illustration of a scene that I did in the Sonic Forces episode where Sonic was being held prisoner. I was super surprised to get a notification from Tumblr, I'm not on there that often, and I was delighted to see this wonderful artwork. I try to keep my eye out for stuff like this whenever I can, and when I find out that people are getting expired from what I'm doing here, it brings me such overwhelming joy. Discontented fairy, keep on doing what you're doing. I really don't have much else to say, this video is really long as it is and I don't want to keep petering around. All I can hope is that you're taking the chance to think about some story elements, and I hope that this video was as entertaining to watch as it was for me to make it, even though it took me five months to do it. Stick around for a couple more seconds to get a tease of what the next video is going to be, and don't worry, it won't be another five months like the last video was. My name is EPZ379, and I'll see you for the next operation.